connect, we want them to learn, we want them to uh, collaborate. Uh, and so every year we try to make changes and we try to add things to the program. Uh, for example, we're going to start off with an open mic, and the open mic really is uh, for people to ask for help or um, connect with you or let, them know, let you know what they're doing so you can uh, potentially work with them. Uh, so if there's one person here who wants to jump in line for the open mic without a slide, you're, we have one slot, someone didn't show up. Uh, but basically, uh, the day is going to be filled with people who have raised money, who are building successful businesses, who are scaling stuff. And uh, we, we want you to learn, we want you to engage. And so another thing we added this year was a, a second stage, which is basically an informal Q&A, uh, not just with the investors who are speaking, but also the entrepreneurs. So after each uh, panel or discussion, uh, majority of the speakers will be in the second room. So there's a second room on the other side of the building. It's marked as the investor stage. Uh, by the way, I'm Nima. Uh, I've been doing this uh, for the last nine years, I think, uh, up here. It's always fun. Um, I learn a lot, and uh, I hope you guys have fun today. Um, so with that, we're going to invite our first uh, open mic candidate. Come on up. Mic's working, mic 11. Awesome. So you have one minute. Yep, slide, slide will be on. Next one, Emotions. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. I'm PNPN, PN, founder of Emotions. So um, my background, I have been a product manager for about five years uh, in Silicon Valley as, as well as in the East Coast, uh, went to Yale. And uh, my mission is to help people have better lives and better relationships. So how do we achieve that? Think about what are the most important skills in your life and career. One is emotional intelligence. Second is uh, communication. So the product we want to build is to help people improve emotional intelligence and communications through applied AI. And um, we are looking for team members, um, beta users, and investors. So if you're interested in joining me, please find me after stage, or please connect to me with me on LinkedIn, or email me at uh, pnpn.xu at ayya.edu. And uh, in terms of market sizing, we, ha we see that there's $25 billion market cap for uh, emotions analytics and also other use cases. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, that's, I think, the most difficult email I just have ever seen. Uh, so leave it up for one minute. Come, come on up. All right. Did it great. Hi. I'm a little nervous, but uh, my name is Tari. I have traveled all the way from the East Coast to here because I believe here's where innovation happens and innovations get uh, nurtured. So I've been a management consultant for over two decades working in the data risk and process automation space. And uh, the reason I'm here is I've been working with several financial organizations and uh, the existing products in this space are not very business friendly and we have developed prototypes with two clients who are using it and using Visio, Excel, and things like that. And now we developed, I developed uh, with some help, a, a prototype uh, which is, just gives an idea of what it is. So what I'm here for is to help, ask for help, and co-founders and developers, so we can take this product to its next full stage and, and through conferences, et cetera, market this and take it to the market. And I feel it's already been tested we have a prototype, I'm just looking for co-founders and developers to help me take it to the next stage. Thank you. Don't be nervous, rock it. Okay, Nimblebox, come on. Thank you. Good morning, Startup Conference. How's it going? Uh, hi, I'm Anshuman and I'm the founder of Nimblebox.ai. Artificial in, uh, intelligence development is really hard. It takes hours and hours of time. Uh, you have to be a cloud expert, and you cannot do any of it before you write a single line of code. We make AI development easy. More than 1,000 developers, students, data scientists 
used nimble box from Silicon Valley to Asia every month. If you are an AI startup, if you or your company works in AI, ML, and data science, come find me. We'll make it happen for you. Thank you. Seth, so that, that's pretty good. OK, uh, we've got three people who are just going to ad hoc and come up here. What was your name? Girish. All right, do it. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. I was like, you know, uh, thanks for uh, on the run time. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me ask a question first. Like, how many of you speak more than one language here? Can you please raise your hands? Great. How many of you speak more than two languages here? Or speak or understand? Okay. Great. Uh, how many of you did not use any chat application over the weekend, like a WhatsApp? iMessage. Is there anyone who didn't use a chat application in the last weekend, like last two days? Great. Uh, one out of everyone. OK, now my name is Girish. Uh, we are from Kulfi. It's a New York-based startup. Uh, we started uh, doing GIF, GIF, how you call it, like GIF or GIF. Uh, so we started doing GIFs for India, and we want to scale to every language in the world. So there are 78 trillion messages go every day in the chat messages, all including uh, WhatsApp, Viber, iMessage, everything. And uh, uh, we are like a GIF sharing platform for every language in the world. OK, thank you. And I'm here for looking to raise investment. We are one year, two years old, and we already like 1 million downloads. Thank you so much. Awesome. Jackie? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jackie. Um, we're here in Silicon Valley, so uh, I'm in healthcare. Um, basically, what I'm doing is um, a house, like, um, set up a cloud-based um, platform for patients to see the doctor globally. So you might be heard people like senior go uh, in developing country for the same procedure with low cost. Um, so that's the, that's the industry what I'm in. But uh, the way I'm here today is um, like scale up, not agency, not too much work. Um, just um, put everything um, on cloud and then let AI do that labors for you know tons of people in this world. My industry is, okay, my base in, um, uh, San Mateo, uh, Silicon Valley. So I'm looking for um, a million funding and um, co-founders, uh, especially um, a CTO, because I'm in healthcare. I'm not a tech field. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, Puni, come on. We're running late. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Puni, and I'm the founder of a company called Wow50. Imagine for a few seconds, do you know someone who's over 50 and has ever felt being socially isolated at the time of travel or in their homes? Well, that person is not alone. There are 30 million people, roughly one third of the population in US who report social isolation. Well, our company, WOW50, has a novel approach to solve and at the same time keep their lives healthy we're building wellness homes for people over 50, starting from San Diego, fully furnished, something like Golden Girls, a lot of people relate to that. Uh, uh, bringing the wellness aspect more in a lifestyle so that they can live in a more engaging environment. And I would like you to consider joining a mission, uh, either by helping us raise a seed round or just rooting for us. Just let other people know that we exist. Thank you so much, take care. Okay, use this mic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna start with the main program. Um, how many of you are either building a company, fundraising, uh, have started a company, have raised money? How many of you are at that stage? Okay. Uh, so you will soon discover that uh, you'll be spending a big chunk of your time fundraising, and then the other chunk you'll be spending uh, recruiting. 
because fundamentally it's broken, uh, and you're fundraising to recruit, to build, to fundraise, to recruit, and it's a never-ending story. So uh, I have done a lot of recruiting in, in various roles, and I've always thought that this process is broken. And so Amon uh, and the guys at TripleByte are, are trying to solve that problem. Uh, they've raised a bunch of money and so a bunch of traction, so come on up. I want to welcome you. And thank you. Awesome. Let's see, yeah, so uh, my name's Amin, and I'm one of the co-founders of TripleByte, and we are a hiring marketplace uh, used by engineers to get jobs at tech companies. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about, yeah, how to hire your first 10 engineers at a startup. So, you know, first of all, I wanna point out that hiring is absolutely critical. Um, it's probably the single most important thing that you have to get right in order to build a successful company. Um, and it's, it's challenging, right? Hiring is fundamentally about people. You have, to, you have to find people. You have to evaluate people's potential. You have to convince people to you know, believe in you and join your company. And yeah, people are not, not simple, right? So challenging can go wrong in, in all kinds of ways. Um, you, might, you might fail to, to find anybody who, who wants to apply to your, to your startup. Um, your interview might, might be biased. It might measure the wrong skills. Um, you might invest weeks of work in a candidate only to have them you know, take an offer at a different company. And so today I'm gonna talk about uh, ways to avoid those problems. Uh, so first question before I jump in is, you know, why should you trust me about any of this? And you know, one answer is that I've done a lot of interviews. <laughs> um, at Trillbyte, we do a full interview with every candidate who applies to our, to our, our platform, and I've done over a thousand of those interviews. But I think a, a better reason to trust me is the, the vantage point that Trillbyte has. Um, we have right now um, over 500 companies on our platform, and we work with over 300 candidates every week, and we get honest feedback from both the candidates and the companies. And so this gives us data on you know, what companies and what candidates actually want, and that data is the basis for, for most of the advice I'm gonna give here today. Uh, yeah, so here's what I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna talk about how to source candidates, um, how to interview candidates, how to make hiring decisions, and then finally, how to make offers and, and close, you know, convince candidates to, to join your company. Um, yeah, this is, this is a lot to cover in 20 minutes. Uh, so you guys are gonna get the super condensed Cliff Notes version, and I'm gonna try to focus on concrete points of advice that you guys can, can sort of apply to, to help you hire. Let's jump in. Uh, so first, uh, sourcing. I wanna start with what not to do, and that's to you know, sit around and wait for people to email in their resumes to you or to reply to your careers page. Uh, these are called inbound applicants, and yeah, to be, to be kind of frank about it, inbound applicants tend to be bad. There's, there's significant selection bias in who, you know, who bothers to apply to companies online, and that's especially true if you're a startup and don't have, you have a brand. Um, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't universal, so by all means take a look at people who, who apply to your company, but inbound applicants are typically not a major source of candidates for any company, and they you know, almost certainly will not solve your sourcing problem. Uh, let's see, oh, yeah. So if you can't, you know, if, if waiting around for people to apply to you doesn't work, what, you know, what, what is it that you should do to source engineers? And I think the most important single answer is that sourcing is about your brand. It's about having a, you know, a good answer to this question, right? Why should an engineer join your company? Um, and a point I wanna make here is that answering this question is, it's very different than uh, you know, pitching, pitching investors, pitching VCs. A mistake that we see founders make is to try to reuse their investor pitch with candidates. And you know, this doesn't work, right? Candidates joining your company don't care about you know, your CAC or the you know, lifetime value of a customer or you know, you know, what, your, what your total addressable market is. What, what motivates candidates is the core mission 
of your company, the, the, you know, the problem you're solving, um, you know, whether they're going to have you know, smart coworkers that they can learn from, um, things like that. So um, longer term, the way to solve the sourcing problem is to, to build a brand, right? to answer these questions and to build a brand, to, to get your name out there, to, to write blog posts, to get content on Hacker News. Um, and what I recommend thinking about there is what is something that your company knows that nobody else knows? What is the unique inside of your business? What data do you have that, that the world might find interesting? And another, another way to think about this is that you want to sort of exploit the niche that your company is in, and you, you shouldn't be worried about being kind of actually divisive to do that. So, you know, for example, if your company, um, if, you're, if you're using Haskell to, you know, as, your, as your main programming language, or if you believe strongly that you know, open plan offices are terrible and that you're going to give every employee at your company a room with a door, then like, double down on this, right? Blog about it. Build a brand about your position on these issues. So, um, you know, long term, the, the way to get better at sourcing is to build a brand. Um, but, you know, short term, what do you do? And I think the best advice there is that you have to find people who already have some reason to want to join your company. And I think the best place to start there is actually with your, your friends and family, your network. Um, and this, you know, hiring from your network, this is how most startups hire you know, their entire initial team. Um, some advice here. So where I see founders fail at this is by you know, treating their, their friends, treating their network like friends and not like, like sales leads. Um, and this is actually a mistake, right? If you, you are, when talking to your friend, you're, you're gonna be much less willing to really pitch to really double down, to really try to convince them. And yeah, that's an error. Like you have to figure out how to sell effectively to your network and, and get everyone in your company involved in it. And so the process that I recommend is, is this, right? Just sit down one-on-one -on -one with every member and every employee at your company and you know, go through with them you know, their, 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 all their LinkedIn connections, go through all their Facebook friends, create a spreadsheet and just add every engineer has any connection to anybody at your company. And once you've finished this with every employee at your company, you know, take that spreadsheet and treat it exactly the same way you would treat any other list of high value sales leads, right? Just craft a message to every one of those people, right? Send, send super engaging emails, you know, follow up, keep engaging with every candidate on that list until you get either a yes or a clear no from each of those people. And then repeat this process every few months um, and definitely with every new employee who joins your company. Okay, outbound sourcing. Um, this is kind of the classic technique where recruiters send you know, hundreds of emails, hundreds of LinkedIn messages to strangers. And this is actually the typical way that big companies source most of their candidates. Um, but it tends not to work for startups. And it tends not to work because until you've built a brand, you're going to have an extremely low response rate. And so what I recommend to startups is first, ignore this until after you've at least temporarily exhausted sourcing from your network. Right? Sourcing from the network is better, do that first. After you've exhausted your network, um, you can make this work, but you have to work harder than big companies. So you, you have to find you know, a group of people who are already passionate about some aspect of your company, you know, about the space you're in, about your mission. And then once you've found those people, you have to craft much more detailed messages. So I would budget between 10 to, to 20 minutes per message you send, and actually investigate each candidate. You know, read their blog, you know, look at things they've written, you know, look at their open source contributions, and then write them actually fairly detailed email messages, pitching them specifically and, and, and mentioning your you know, things, you, you know, things that you like about their background. Um, yeah, that's my final point here about sourcing. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. Most job descriptions um, are just completely rubbish. Um, people write job descriptions in this kind of dispassionate academic list of requirements, totally boring language. And this just completely misses the fact that a job description is fundamentally a pitch. It's fundamentally marketing material, right? It should be about, it should be exciting. It should be about why this, why this is an exciting role and why this candidate, what this candidate could work on at your company which would be fun and exciting. And the, the good news here is that if you actually put effort into writing your job descriptions and making them compelling and, and exciting, you will already have a way to kind of Stand, you know, stand out among, among almost all of the companies out there. 
I really don't understand why most companies write such bad job descriptions. Okay, uh, on the second point, um, how to interview. So the core challenge of interviewing is inconsistency. It's noise in the interview process. And by this I mean sort of you know, to what extent are interview results predictable, right? So if you had to re-interview all of your current coworkers um, or you know, people you've worked with in the past, right, what portion of those folks would pass the interview a second time? And uh, we've actually been able to get some data on this at TripleByte. Uh, so I calculated a stat called the inter-rater reliability between all of the interviewers and all of the companies on our platform. And you know, this is a measure of to what extent they tend to agree about which engineers are good and which engineers are bad. And it's on this range of zero to one, where zero means no agreement, and one is, is perfect agreement. And what I got was a number uh, just over 0 0.1. So you know, first of all, that number is clearly uh, much closer to the zero than to the one. Uh, but, but to give it more context, I calculated the same stat looking at a data set of, um, of online movie reviews. And what I got was actually a very similar number. So the context here is that you know, 100 managers and interviewers agree about which candidates are best at about the same rate that Netflix viewers agree about which movies are best. Um, yeah, which is, it's not a lot of agreement, right? Interviewers are fundamentally, interviews rather, are fundamentally noisy. Um, and I think reducing this noise is, is the core challenge in when designing an interview process. And so I'm gonna go over some, some tips for how you can make your interviews less noisy. Um, uh, my first most important tip is to use structured interviews. And what I mean by this is mostly just go through the process of thinking about upfront what skills matter for your company, right? Would you rather hire someone who's very fast, very productive, but makes some mistakes, or someone who's you know, slower but careful and always tests all their code, right? It, like, is it important for you that people you hire are strong in academic computer science? And then once you've answered these questions, you can design sort of interview segments that measure those skills. Uh, the topic of structured interviews is, it's much deeper than this. So, you know, there's a lot to go into. You can sort of hire psychometricians and try to design an optimally predictive process. Um, that's more or less what my company focuses on. Um, but I think the key takeaway for startups is mostly the exercise of thinking through what matters and making sure that your interview is roughly measuring those areas. And that, that's also a great way to reduce bias in interviews. Um, as in, you know, sexism, racism, there will be things you absolutely don't want involved in your interview process. Um, what the research on that shows is that bias tends to creep into interviews when the interviewers are told to make big, high-level decisions. Is this person somebody we want to hire? And that there's less bias when the interviewers are given more concrete axes to evaluate. And so by just planting in your own mind what matters is these skills, that's a way to reduce bias and make better decisions. Um, okay, second point here, um, some tips to, to, for better interview questions. So you want to avoid questions that require a leap of insight from the candidate. Uh, so you want there to be more than just a single hard problem they have to solve. And so an example of a bad interview question is, you know, you could, you could tell a candidate, imagine you've been given an unstored list of integers, you know, what's a linear time algorithm to find the, you know, k of the smallest element in that list for some integer, from value k. Um, you know, the, the solution to this problem is an algorithm called quick select, and if the candidate knows that, they're going to answer the question very quickly and very well. Uh, but if they don't know that, right, they're going to have to basically invent quick select during the interview, and that requires a real leap of insight. Most people are going to fail at that. And so a much better way to actually phrase basically the same interview question is to say, you know, hey candidate, here's a two-page write-up of an algorithm called quick select. Please read it, spend 10 minutes on it, and then, you know, spend the next 40 minutes implementing this in your favorite language. In that case, you're getting much more signal. You're seeing, can this candidate take this idea and render that into working code? Uh, yeah, you also want to avoid specialized knowledge. So, you know, assuming you, that you're not trying to measure knowledge of more advanced data structures in your interview, you should try to limit your questions to operations on, you know, on strings, on arrays, and not more complicated, you know, prefix trees or red-black trees or anything like that. I'm gonna skip this. Um, okay, uh, final point here. Um, you wanna have a diverse interview team. 
So you know, the interviewers bring their own background and experience, and you, will, you, you, know, you get a more accurate signal if you have a diversity of backgrounds and experiences you know, among the people who are evaluating the candidate. And um, a, a point here for startups is that you know, if, if you're just you, or if you're you, know, you and your co-founder, obviously, you are who you are, you can't change that. Um, a thing you can do is actually bring in friends, bring in outsiders, and have the initial interview panel for your employees be more than just you. Okay, on to the final point, um, how to close engineers. So, first of all, um, closing is, is important. Um, uh, and that, that's probably fairly obvious to you, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I wanna just talk about how important it is. So, this, this is a conversion funnel. Um, this is actually a very optimistic conversion funnel, by the way. This is kind of the best case estimates of conversion rates for a startup. You can see we had about, you know, we, we, we reached out to 300 candidates, 60 replied. You know, we did probably an hour-long phone screen with you know, 30 of them. We did probably a six-hour interview with 10 of them, we made two offers, and we closed one candidate. And to just think about what this would look like if we hadn't closed that one candidate at the end, if that candidate had decided to go work at Google, right? We would have, all of these hours of work would have been for nothing. And so it is, you know, closing candidates at the end of this funnel is just an extremely important, extremely leveraged thing to do. So how do you do it? Well, I think the most important insight here is that, you know, closing starts early. So closing candidates is about more than just the phone call you have with the candidate after you make them an offer. It's about the entire process. And in fact, uh, we see at TripleByte that candidates tend to be more impacted by the perception of a company during the interview. So I think making the interview itself positive is actually one of the most important things you can do to close candidates. And so um, some advice there. Um, one thing I recommend is actually having all the interviewers get together before the candidate arri arrives and just talk about the candidate. What's their background? How do you pronounce their name? What do we know about them? What are they looking for, right? And communicating to the interviewers that their job is, you know, it's 50% to evaluate, but it's 50% to sell the candidate right, to answer their questions and provide a positive experience. Um, I think it's good to include a demo session in interviews. So like a four, like half an hour purely to, to sell the candidate, where they meet with some engineers and they, you get to look at cool unreleased features, the current problems you're working on, kind of a behind the scenes look at your company. Um, yeah, and then finally, uh, so I mentioned diverse interviewers in the context of accuracy, uh, but it's also important for closing candidates. Um, and this is especially true for candidates from underrepresented groups. Um, we've done some surveys here, and simply seeing that people from different backgrounds can be successful in the company is especially important in closing those candidates. And the best way to do that is just to include people you know, of diverse backgrounds on the interview panel. Uh, speed is your weapon. Uh, this is a place where startups can, can, can have an advantage over big companies. So big companies take weeks, sometimes, Google takes sometimes over a month to make an offer to a candidate. If you can make that offer like same day or next day, um, that's a big advantage. Uh, it's okay to, to call in backup to close a candidate. And so your, your first few hires are critical to your company. And so and get, you know, get your investors involved. Have them meet with the candidate. Um, have your entire team email the candidate, even if they didn't you know, interview them. Um, and the thing that we did early actually was have the hiring manager and one of our founders fly out and meet the candidate afterward for lunch. So at the keynote, we were hiring someone from Vancouver, we have our, the hiring manager and the CEO show up on an airplane and get lunch with them. You know, that's not something that Google can do. Um, and uh, your final point here is, it's like a lot, little like a trick is that you can, you can pretend the candidate already accepted. And so when talking to them, you know, use, use the future tense, not the conditional. Say, you know, you know when you join the company, your, your, your role will be X, not, you know, were you to join, your role would be X. Um, you know, invite them to events. And not, not, maybe not even just like, not you know, fancy events, but invite them to, the, to, to, to your team all hands, right? Pretend they're already employed and include them on emails. Get to, get to give them a look kind of under the hood at the company. Get that? Yeah, um, I think that's, uh, that's most of my advice. Um, I've got one minute left and I, I wanna actually spend that um, talking a bit about, about Triple Byte. Uh, so, um, my company, TripleByte, um, we, we, we help companies um, hire, and we'd, we'd love to work with any of you. Uh, we actually, uh, the, the, the startups Cruise and Flexport both hired over half of their initial uh, 10 engineers through our platform. And a bit about how we work. So, our mission is 
background blind assessment. Um, so you know, engineers apply to us from a diverse set of backgrounds. Uh, we do a full interview without looking at their resume. And then if they pass that interview, we match them with companies. And according to our data, only about 20% of skilled programmers in the United States have sort of conventionally strong resumes. And so our mission is to help you hire from sort of that other 80%. And uh, this also ends up uh, helping you hire very quickly. Uh, so because we have this big pool of talent waiting to go, um, startups are able to hire on our platform much faster than, than through their own process. So this graph actually comes from one of our clients, Box. Um, they actually created this graph, this is a study they did, and their, via their regular process, it took them an average of about 75 days to hire a candidate, and through our process, they're able to hire in an average of, uh, of uh, 35 days, so less than half the time. So yeah, um, love to work with any of you, and we're actually offering a special discount uh, to attendees of Startup Conference. Um, if you create an account in the next week, uh, we'll give you 20% off of your first hire. Yeah, um, that's it. I'd love your thoughts. Um, sorry, I, I didn't have time for Q&A, but come find me afterward. Uh, email me. I'd love to talk to, to all of you. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, um, so the, that's the hiring process. Uh, but like I mentioned before, uh, if you're building a company, you're constantly going to be fundraising. Um, and if we can set up the chairs, well, well I just introduce. Uh, you'll be fundraising. And so uh, any time you can save on the recruiting part uh, allows you to invest in the other parts. Which, by the way, you're still trying to build a product and uh, do all the things that a company has to do, talk to customers, A-B test. But the two things, again, I, I, that I think take up most of the time, at least for the founders or the CEO, is this recruiting and fundraising. So our next panel is gonna be talking about uh, the trials and tribulations of fundraising. I think amongst the th uh, four panelists, uh, the few hundred million dollars of venture money that they've raised or been involved in, uh, also a couple exits. So with that, I want to introduce Brian uh, from Expert Dojo. So Ex Expert Dojo is an incubator accelerator program in Southern California. Uh, Brian's worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs. And then the panel, uh, Stacey Epstein, Alex Fielding, and Ari Gossman, um, they'll do quick intros themselves. Uh, let's give them a warm welcome. Sure. And we begin. So uh, <laughs> we'll start off with uh, just quick introductions of, of who we are, then we'll kick into some questions, hopefully give you some, as much feedback as we possibly can within 20 minutes. Um, I'll start off. Um, uh, Expert Dojo, we're an international accelerator in Southern California. We're based in Santa Monica and Silicon Beach in about 8,000 square feet. We invest in about 30 to 50 companies every single year. Our check sizes are between fifty and hundred thousand dollars. Our preferred country is Israel, but we also invest in South Korea. We invest in Canada. We invest in Mexico. We invest in Brazil, and we just did an investment in Africa as well. Um, I will, I will I'll throw in two extra things. That I think maybe the panel can jump into as well. I mean, number one, um, the biggest hack, as far as um, in recent memory for me, of somebody was fundraising, and it was one of my companies. And I don't know if I'm proud or ashamed. Um, and I won't say what religion that that person converted to, but they converted to the religion on a, on a Saturday morning and ended up in that particular place and found their investor who they knew was going to be there and had to go to that particular place of religion for at least four weeks before they built up the relationship. Is it a terrible sacrilegious thing to do or is it just a really smart founder? I am not the one to judge. Um, I'll also throw in a nightmare story in there as well, which is one to be cautious of. At this precise moment, I have a startup whose investor at seed round is currently suing the startup and suing the startup for um, what he's calling a, a malicious destruction of the business, which was really just emotions on either side. But it brings a caution retail that when we do fundraise money, we have to be aware that there's, there's pain on either side. There's pain on the founder because you guys want to break through. There's pain on the investor because nobody wants to lose a million dollars. 
And on that nice depressing note, <laughs> Stacy, you want to go next? Did he find God? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I found that, a that new one. Really you, you find it's out there's really a few different it, gods right? when it comes to fundraising. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Stacey Epstein. Uh, we're talking about fundraising, so I'll frame my experience in uh, my fundraising experience. So I've been in enterprise software for about 30 years. Uh, was at Oracle in the early days. Uh, my first real fundraising experience was I was the first marketer and the CMO at Success Factors and uh, came on after the first round. So I, I don't even remember. I think we raised five rounds on our way to IPO um, and was worked closely with Lars Dalgard on pretty much every round as the CMO. Then I went to, to ServiceMax, um, was employee 15 and the CMO there. We raised four or five rounds. Um, and then didn't IPO, but GE bought ServiceMax for about a billion dollars. Uh, then I left and went and started Zinc, where we ra raised two rounds, and uh, about six months ago, we were acquired by ServiceMax. So lot of, a lot of uh, rounds and fundraising um, going as far back as around 2005. So it has definitely changed a lot. Um, and uh, certainly my experience is mostly enterprise, but that's, uh, so I'm at ServiceMax right now, uh, helping Zinc get successful in, within ServiceMax. And biggest hack that you've seen oh. in fundraising? I mean, I, to me, this, it's not a hack, and we can spend more time talking about it, um, but it, you know, even watching this morning on the open mic, you absolutely have to very quickly explain what you do and getting to benefits, and the problem statement's fine, and it, it's not a hack, right? It should be the most fundamental thing you do, but I can't tell you how many times. Like, just, just a few weeks ago, uh, one of my relatives was like, I have this great idea, let me tell you about it. And for 10 minutes, I'm like, I still don't really get what you do. Like, I don't wanna hear benefits, I don't, all I wanna hear, just let me understand ex the, what you do. And people just, they go right past it because they're so trying to impress and all these other things. So um, not a hack, it should be core. Uh, but that's going to be my big thing today is make sure you explain what you do. Is that also your cautionary tale? Um, don't not say what you don't do. Or don't just kill people I mean, with features. You know, there's, there's so much more to a great fundraise. And, and, you know, people put a lot into the pitch. The pitch is important. But the pitch is step one. There's still a lot of miles to cover between the, a great pitch and actually closing an investment, right? So, um, I mean, there's a lot to do in there. And I think it's fine to then, to, you know, great examples and value proposition and um, anecdotes and all the other things that go into it. But those are meaningless. It's same with the website. You know, how many websites do you go to and you're just like, oh, I don't want to see a, a video with your customer saying how great it is when I first get to your website because I don't know what you do. And until I have that core fundamental knowledge, nothing else you say, it all goes right over my head because I'm struggling to figure it out. So awesome. that's Thank my you. big thing. Alex. Uh, I'm Alex Fielding. I'm the CEO of Ripcord. So to... To follow up on Stacy's point, we use giant industrial robots to digitize the world's paper. And we take all that stuff, we stick it in the cloud, and we reconnect it to enterprise systems. Um, on the topic today, Ripcord's raised about $80 million so far. Uh, we'll probably go out and raise some more capital this year. And across my career, I've raised about $200 million in, in venture. I don't think anybody gets a trophy for fundraising, right? I mean, that is. It's basically table stakes. I mean, fundraising is what you have to do to be able to support a growing business. And there's, there's a lot of reasons why you go to do venture fundraising versus um, you know, seed stage or angel fundraising or friends and family. I mean, traditionally, I, I think if you're here, you're already well, well aware of what you want to accomplish. But venture is really about going fast. And I, I haven't met anybody who's raised venture capital with the intention of going slowly or without the fear that somebody's going to come and, and overtake them. So I, I think my number one fundraising hack, which it's not really a hack, is, is be cognitive of, you know, first of all, good storytelling, right? Make sure that people know what you do. And secondly, timing, because timing is everything. And believe it or not, uh, it's not like there's a fundraising season. 
but you probably don't want to go out and start raising a round between Thanksgiving and Christmas when everybody's away on vacation and skiing and you're going to have trouble scheduling meetings. Um, I, I think another kind of follow-up hack is just realizing that there are great resources like the funded, uh, which, you know, I think if you don't have an account on the funded, go get one. It doesn't cost you anything. gives you good insight into the process. But I, I think that's also a, a, a follow-on to, you know, opportunities are being tracked, and you have to be aware, it's related to timing, when you go out and actually pitch and how you build a strategy around fundraising. I mean, uh, if, if you're going off and meeting with one potential investor, that's kind of like buying, you know, one lottery ticket. Great, and you've raised $200 million. So when you say go fast, what does that mean? Because I think everybody in their heads, we all want to go fast. But sometimes it's not quite that simple, and sometimes we end up going slow. What are the things that you specifically did for the $200 million that helped you get there by going fast as opposed to other people who didn't? I, I think it's actually a, almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that if you have to go fast, if you must go fast, and what I mean by that is there's a competitor that's right behind you that's thinking about doing the same thing. There's you know, a, a whole market evolving around a specific segment of ideas or technologies, and you either become the first, the, the best in the space in that new category, you basically create the category, or you own some segment of that technology. You have to do that. Uh, very, very quickly, or you're going to get overrun by companies that have a lot more resources and a lot more talent, especially than a small startup company, right? So I, I think the, the lesson learned there is if you have to go fast, there's also a benefit, which is if you're in venture capital, you want to invest in companies that have to move very quickly, um, you know, not just based on return profile and what those investors expect, but just the opportunity eroding around it. You know, there's going to be a few winners and there's going to be a lot of losers and you want to be in the winner category. I like it. We're going to come back to it. Right. Thanks. Ari. Yeah. Ari Roisman, founder and CEO of Glide. Spent the last few years getting into hardware. Um, we've built the camera for the Apple Watch, although we have yet to bring the product to market. Uh, we've raised over 50 million. We started off really focused on a, a high growth um, communications play. We pioneered instant video messaging or video walkie-talkie, basically push to talk video. And then uh, really been through a lot, ups and downs, and you know, happy to be here today and share some of the learnings. I think you know, financing, after you kind of learn the, 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 the basics and understand um, the lay of the land, it's really more art than science. Um, and it's driven by people. At the end of the day, people are making decisions whether or not they want to invest in your company. So I think understanding how to get in front of the right people and then establishing rapport and trying to build relationships with the right people, keeping in touch with them. And then it's all about the, this story. And this story is a constant evolution. And having that, that evolution of that story informed by learnings about your business, perspectives, from others that have been through this before, have relevant experience. There's some initial thoughts. Beautiful. And look, I know when you raise $50 million, I mean, that road is paved with beautiful bricks, but there's a couple of boulders and weeds in there as well. If you have to think back to something you did that was so horrible that you just woke up in the middle of the night and said, what the hell did I do that for? On the journey. Are you thinking of something specific? No, just we all, we all do it, right? I, I remember, like, so I'll put it into context. I always remember when I was doing a conference years ago, way before I had an accelerator, I was working with a massive corporation, and they said to me, here's $30,000, and you're going to do it. They were our first sponsor coming in. This was back in the day. And, they, and then somebody said, well, you should go up and meet these guys. And I'm going, yeah, I'll go up and meet these guys. I'll go up and see them. Anyway, I thought the meeting went great. Immediately after the meeting, they asked me to tear up the check, right? So there are moments when we're on a journey, and that journey is so beautiful. And then we just do something, which is a great lesson for other people during it, which maybe is a fundraising moment that people can learn from. Yeah, so I, early, early on, before I raised any money, I remember sitting down with one of the original partners, I believe one of the early partners at Benchmark, Michael Eisenberg, who now has a, a, small, a Series A fund in, in Israel, Aleph, I'm sure you're familiar with if you're looking at deals in Israel. 
And he told me he's seen more companies die of indigestion than starvation, meaning he's seen more companies really go through turmoil through having too much money than those that don't have enough. It, here, especially here in, in Silicon Valley, and especially when things get frothy and there's a lot of excitement around startups and then more and more folks that don't really understand venture or understand how these companies go from an idea to becoming a, pi a real leader or a pioneer in a new market, you get excited just about, the, from the outside looking in, it's easy to get excited just about the, the financing part of this. But uh, Alex, but as, Al, yeah? Yeah, yeah. But as Alex mentioned, it's not, you know, for, for good companies, uh, and I think you know, certainly I strive to be in that bucket, it's, but can't, you know, can't say that every step along the journey, you know, we, we've squarely fallen in that bucket. But good companies really don't look at, at, at financing as a strategy, it's really a tactic to fuel the overall strategy of the company. And the, and the best thing you can do is, is create value somehow without taking other people's money. I, you know, we look, at, we look at fundraising as if it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a badge of honor, it's medals. I think it really just makes the stakes a lot higher. It totally takes away your, your focus from the business and then it, it becomes a crutch depending upon the type of business you're trying to build. So you really have to understand specifically what, what is it that you're trying to build and then how dependent are you on outside funding? Are there other ways of funding? There's other sources of capital. But it's really important to understand how, how venture firms are structured and how they think about deals and then how you know, taking money can, from venture can actually really handicap you depending upon what you aspire to do. And that's your theme for this panel today is don't focus so much on the fundraising. Focus much more on building something incredible and building something incredible at the right pace rather than building something fast just for the sake of building something fast. If people see you build something incredible and you're setting at milestone that you're gonna hit and you're hitting those milestones, then the probability of you failing reduces every single day, which means the probability of getting investment increases. Visionary, I, uh, you wanna say something first? Well, yeah, I, you're, I think it was a really great question about those moments when you're like, oh, why did I do that? And I mentioned, I, I was part of a lot of rounds of funding as a CMO and working on the pitch deck. But then when I was the CEO was the first time I was actually negotiating the deal with an investor, right? And I found myself all the time in conversations where like, half the time I didn't even know what terms they're talking about and um, just because I had never had that experience. Now, when you're further along and you're in later stages, you're going to have a CFO, you're going to have a general counsel. And I mean, I had a law firm. I had Fenwick. I had a very good law firm. But I think sometimes they just assume that you know, right? And you're on a call and it doesn't occur to them, well, maybe she didn't really know what that term is. And there were times that, like, the next day I'd be like, I, I hope I answered that right, but I wasn't. But what was a drag along clause? I don't know. I got to Google it while I'm on the phone, right? <laughs> How much stock should I leave available for hiring over the net until I raise money again? Just things that it's. I'm not stupid. I just had never had those conversations. So my advice is, everybody who's doing early stage and hasn't really been the CEO and around, find somebody that you can talk to, right? If you don't have a great lawyer, you don't have a GC or a CFO, find someone that when you hang up, you can call and go, hey, this came up, explain it to me so I know how to answer it, right? And the other is be humble about it. Like, you know, finally I just said, hey guys, I, I got to remind you, this is my first time doing this. I don't know how to answer that question. Give me a day and I'll come back to you with my response, right? And so I didn't feel like I had to be like, oh, I know everything about fundraising. Like, you know, it was my first time. And when I finally just said that, I feel like I had a lot more willingness to help me with the nuances here and there that I had never experienced. Then my second thing about going back and looking back at what you do after you raise money. I feel there's always a balance between, you know, every investor wants to know what are you going to use the money for, right? And it's typically some combination of you're fueling innovation or you're fueling growth, right? At Success Factors and at ServiceMax, we had product market fit super early and pretty much every round was just pouring fuel on it, adding salespeople, adding marketing, just literally grow, grow, grow. At Zinc, um, and by the way, since I didn't say before what we do, even though that's the important thing to say is, so we're a messaging app, but we're focused on 
um, field service industry. So guys that drive in white vans and fix things and probably would never use Slack because it's just too much for them. They want it to look like WhatsApp. That's what we do. Um, it took us a while to find product market fit, right? And so in retrospect, I was so used to pouring fuel on it and, and fueling growth and I needed more time and, and when you're all, you've always got that runway ahead of you, like when are you gonna raise the next round? I think it, we could have found even more success if we had just waited. And you feel the pressure, like if I don't hire this many people then I won't drive this much growth and then I won't be able to raise the, rest, the next round, but sometimes you're gonna burn that money anyway. So really being thoughtful about where are we in product market fit and finding the right balance between whether you're putting your money into innovation to get to product market fit or are you just pouring fuel on it to grow fast? That may be one of the best pieces of advice I've heard for a long time because that pressure is intense. By the way, timing people, if, if, if you just tell us when we're up, okay, because otherwise <laughs> I'm Irish. We'll talk all day, okay? So if we're still good for time, 12 minutes, beautiful, okay. So I want to go a little bit deeper in because I love that whole focus on, on whether you go for product market fit and you stay back and you make yourself great. I personally have always struggled with lean startup. Actually, let me rephrase it. I've always struggled with the way people have interpreted lean startup which is let's just build something really fast and get it out there, right? Because you then spend all of the time back wheeling to try and get yourself back in. Build something incredible. And if you haven't built something incredible, focus on that. If you have, focus on growing it. And um, I want to focus on another point. And I don't want to pigeonhole you here, but it's a, down in, in Santa Monica, it's a really interesting time. If you'd said to me four or five years ago, there were very few female LPs, there were hardly any f uh, female GPs. Um, most of the, the females in funds were associates. And there were not a massive amount of female entrepreneurs breaking through. Uh, if I look at this year, uh, we have a huge parity. We did an event last week, and there were at least 80 female LPs and GPs, which I think we all know is being driven by the boardroom, which is, which is great news. Um, and our cohort this year is a larger amount of female uh, entrepreneurs than male entrepreneurs, but just because they're better, not because we care, right? Um, can you just talk a little bit as to how you see females in fundraising and how things are changing maybe at the moment? Am I being too optimistic about how, how things are right now? Um, no, I'm super optimistic too. Um, and, and as I said, I've been, I worked at Oracle in 1991 and it was like there were no women in leader. There was like one female leader that anybody had to look up to. Like in 30 years, it's been a huge dramatic shift. But I definitely think in the last like gosh, three, three, five years. It's really, really changed. And I think part of it, it is, it is just part of the conversation all the time, especially in the Valley, right? Everybody wants a female on the board. Everybody wants a female on their leadership team. And that's a great thing. I mean, I think it's really helped for a little bit more equality and a little bit more opportunities for women. Um, I mean, I was, I've been used to being the only woman in the boardroom um, for most of my career. And uh, I had two female board members at Zinc, and I did not make an effort to do that. Like, it happened to be we went to GE Ventures. It was a great corporate investor, and the person that kind of covered our space was a female. We went to Hearst Ventures, and the person that, that uh, well, she found us was a female. It was like, my board was me and two females, and Jason Green from Emergence. We used to tease him all the time for being the only guy on the board. Um, that wouldn't have happened. Um, I, I went to a conference a few months back um, put on by Founders Fund and Shasta, and there were more women. It was mostly like, you know, the younger millennial founders and CEOs was kind of, it was founder, it was dorm room fund actually and Founders Fund. And I was so inspired. I was like, this is incredible. Like, there's more women here than men. This is kind of the future of where it's going. Um, so. I feel super optimistic. I, you know, there's still certainly challenges, um, but I think that it's definitely, there's a lot more equality for, for gender and every type of diversity, so I am super optimistic like you are. Awesome, great. Hey, Ari, can you speak a bit to the product fit that Stacy was talking about? Because when you're building such, something is incredibly complicated and difficult and, and really life-changing, not just for people, but for the people you're actually doing it for, it's got to be really hard. Maybe talk a little bit about that journey and how quickly you found it and some of the challenges you faced. Sure. So it's really important to stay really close to your users. And before you have a product and you 
have users than to stay close to people that have built similar products in some way and can, ad can advise. I, you know, there, there's, an, there's an adage in this town that if you go in asking for money, you get advice. And if you go in asking for advice, maybe you get some money. So when you think about the fundraising process, it's really about one person, oftentimes, you know, it seems like it's a group, but it's really one person who's, who's pushing that group to make a decision. Oftentimes, whether they'll admit it or not, those decisions are really emotional, and then they're looking for facts to back up that gut instinct. And, you know, it's, really, it's all about connecting with that person and then, and then really showing, I mean, you're building relationships, so you're showing them that you're someone that wants to learn, is coachable. So I think getting out there and really understanding what are the KPIs that are most relevant for, for your business, not, not just what are the KPIs, but you know, what should those numbers look like at various stages? And then you know, maybe one of the hardest jobs of the CEO is understanding whose advice to actually listen to, because you'll get a lot of different opinions and they'll all contradict with one another. So, it's, uh, it's challenging, but I think you know, when you have users and you have data, then you gotta stay close to that data, and then you know, there, there's the whole qualitative side of things in terms of actually engaging with people and, and trying to understand you know, how, they, how they feel about the product, what things. It's also how you engage with them, right? Because it's sure. hard, because a lot of the time your user is like your mom. She just wants to say nice things. It's like, of right. course, you're wonderful. You're the brightest boy in the Biased, whole world. Biased, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. they don't want to upset you, right? And the, because there's not a huge value. So, totally. So how do you position those questions to get the type of feedback that yeah. can make your product improve? So, you know, we're, we're getting ready to, we're, you know, we're trying to reinvent the personal camera. We think we've built the, the most personal camera. A wearable camera, I'm wearing it on my wrist here, that people are actually going to use and wear. Right? We've seen Google Glass, we've seen spectacles, but neither one of them got so much adoption, but we think the wrist makes sense, and with the Apple Watch, now there's an app store coming to the Apple Watch, was just announced, and we're gonna see the third generation of cellular Apple Watches this fall, fine. But meanwhile, you know, we're really using this internally, keeping things quiet. So I've got, I've got um, like Stacy, I have a CMO who really helps with the story and is passionate about what we're doing, you know, if I invite users in and then I put them in a room and, and my CMO and other folks that are on the creative team are gonna sit with that user, it's gonna turn into a pitch and then whatever data we get back is not gonna be objective. So, you know, just this last week we had a user researcher sitting in a room in a lab in the office just, you know, working with random folks from off the street that are familiar with Apple Watch and are relevant in the total addressable market for our product. And you know, that's, that's one thing you can do. But you, you've got to make sure that you're getting objective, relevant data, and then the way you're interpreting that makes sense given the context that you're in. Beautiful. Alex, anything to add to that? Like, the great thing for all you folks out here is you have people who have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and are still on the journey. So it's not a reminiscent path of how things were before. It's a today path. So, Alex, what are you seeing? Uh, how, I mean, obviously, you're going to agree with that because it ties into our whole user questionnaire thing. But, um, but talk about maybe some of your personal attributes as well as you've been building. Well, I, I think it's interesting because I, I think Ari's right. right? One, of the, one of the challenges is, uh, one of the challenges are that when you go to a user community that have done something a particular way for their whole life and you ask them, would you like something different or could you describe to me what you would like, not knowing what it is that they even you know, envision for the future. We did that early on and I think it was a huge mistake because we went to these users and we said, hey, you guys are our customers. What would you like to see? What could we do to delight you? What would be the, the thing that would just take it over the top? They described exactly what they had at that moment, almost to the T, even though it sucked. <laughs> And, Instead of a car, they wanted faster horses. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, that's exactly right. But a, a pretty fast horse. <laughs> well, it was, it was surprising. I'll give, I'll give you one weird example of this in a pro, from a product standpoint. We asked uh, record managers, you know, people who actually do stuff with enterprise things, invoices, receipts, purchase orders, would you guys use this on mobile? 
because we wanted it on mobile, because why in the hell would we use it tied to a desk? Every single purchaser, every single decision maker that we asked said, no, we don't want it. We built it anyway, because we wanted it. And 30% of our users in the first quarter that we went to market were 100% on mobile. If we took it away, they would riot. But they're the same people who said, I don't want it. I'd never so you're speaking it. to such an important point, um, which I want to bring it back to you, but segue into Stacy as well, which is the vision of the entrepreneur and what we're building at the start. Because it's something that's never existed before. And there's an argument to say that it's not even whole at the beginning. There's an argument to say, actually, we never pivot that we just start at 10 or 11 or 12% of what the product will look like, and then every yes or no on the journey brings us to 13, 14, 15, 16%. Can you speak a little bit, and I want to start with you, Stacey, if I can, because we're talking three companies, you've got a pretty high batting average. That vision at the beginning, and then how you bring both investors and customers in, let's speak to both parties, with that vision at the start and, 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 and kind of how you do that. Yeah, um, you know, when I think of uh, ServiceMax and Success Factors, well, Success Factors was a lot easier because we were selling to HR who had used paper-based performance reviews and like we, we just basically automated it, which was like a dream come true for them, which is why Success Factors was so easy and grew so fast because it was like such an obvious, excuse me, solution. Um, Zinc was a much, much, much harder problem to solve because we knew we had a good vision. We knew that all these, you know, field technicians and what we call deskless workers out there, they're all using WhatsApp and they're using iMessage. I mean, I love the question this morning, how many of you didn't use a chat app this weekend? Nobody, right? Everybody communicates that way, except for them at work, they were, they're still using like, oh, maybe I'm supposed to log into some email or some you know sys enterprise system on my phone or I'm supposed to call in, like just such antiquated ways of communicating. So we knew we could solve a big problem for them. Um, and then they're not going to, I know everyone in this room is probably like, but why wouldn't they use Slack? They won't use Slack. Like to them, Slack is just another complicated enterprise system and they just, adoption is really low. Um, so we, were ha we had this struggle of, do we try to sell to them because it's harder to get to them, they're not gonna be early adopters, or do we go sell to a buyer within the organization, a head of field service, IT? And we spent a lot of time kind of going back and forth between who is our audience? Is it the end user, or is it a buyer in an organization? Slack was very, very successful selling to users, but this audience is very different than a field service technician. And I think that's why when I go back to, we were trying to just get more salespeople out there, but we hadn't really figured out, oh, we got it, who we need to go sell to. And, and that was uh, a big part of what took us probably a little longer than, say, ServiceMax and, and SuccessFact. But again, I love the, the intense folks on the product fit. We're in the last 30 seconds or so. Um, Alex, yeah. finish us out. Actually, give a second last, and then Ari, you finish us out. Okay. So I, I think one thing that I, I would want to add to what Stacy said, which is, is right on the money, is that from a fundraising standpoint, we've always focused on we have a mantra that's going to last forever. And we have a mission that's very, very directly now. So for Ripcord, and I think it helped fundraising, right? Our, our mantra was we want to be the company that takes the world paperless, right? Everybody says the world's going paperless. We couldn't find anybody focused on that. We want to be the company that solves it. That's kind of an insane, audacious mantra that we'll probably never achieve in our lifetime, even though I'd love to. Then we had a mission, and the mission was much more focused on a business problem that we could solve, that we could connect product market fit with today. And I, I think from a fundraising standpoint, I just wanted to add that tidbit, because mantra is all about vision, and mission is all about what are we doing today. So I think that's important. Right. Sorry. The vision is very powerful. If you look at big companies that mm. lacking innovation or lacking direction, trying to figure out what, what the next 10 years look like, Vision is very powerful. So you know, there, there's people that can raise tens or hundreds of millions of dollars based on a vision that's well articulated. So I'd say refining that mission statement and, and the vision and getting, and, and getting there through you know, iterative feedback, talking to smart folks that have experience and perspectives that you don't, is uh, 
will go a long way. Awesome. So look, I can't think of a better way to finish. Vision equals stories. Stories are what bind us all together as human beings and make us connect, and more importantly, make us feel. Create a great vision. Execute the great vision. You won't have a problem finding investors. Thank you very much, panel. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That was really, really good, I have to say. A um, um, lot of good advice. Uh, with that, we're going to take a break here. There's coffee in the other room, and we're starting the investor stage. Um, the first, it's like an informal panel, uh, more geared towards Q&A. So ask questions. Um, the first topic will be valuations, valuations, valuations. Uh, I made these up, so uh, it should be good. Back here at 11:10 uh, uh, for the next panel.
Hello, hello. OK. Uh, I guess we're still missing half the room, but we need to get started. Uh, our next panel is now an interview. Uh, Anand had a last minute emergency and had to cancel this morning, so my apologies, and he sends his apologies. But uh, I think we're going to have an awesome discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know Sarah, Sarah is uh, a super connector, and uh, she's awesome. And uh, Ethan is the um, co-founder of Muesli. So they're going to have a discussion about product. And so um, we've talked about fundraising. We've talked about recruiting. And now we're talking about you have to build some shit. And people have to like it. So. Uh, with that, I want to welcome Sarah and Ethan. Let's give them a round of applause. Talking about building winning products and kind of go through a little bit of a how-to, just from start to finish, building teams to even launching product. And um, we've got Ethan Gui here with me. and. Um, we're going to just go through this with you guys in a fireside chat. Um, if you're responsible for developing your product or your product strategy, you need a blueprint to follow. That doesn't have to be a rigid formula um, for the product itself. Uh, that would probably just yield something boring or an, an inspiring product. But you should probably have a defined approach to developing a winning product strategy. Or if you prefer to look at it this way, you should follow a series of steps that will help you to have a clear path forward for inspiration to strike so that when you get that idea, you can go for it. And you're always looking and always hungry. And that's what we're going to discuss today on this um, fireside chat and hopefully leave you guys with some winning product advice to follow. So my name's Sarah Austin. I am the moderator of this panel. And formerly, I was a product marketing advisor to the CMO of Intel and did product marketing for Ford, GM, HPE, SAP, and Microsoft. And I've spent a lot of time doing natural language processing and data science products. Um, I've shipped two personal assistants and a solution for evaluation of union psychology and a process that's called broad listening that helps people to innovate and do listening for their products. And then I also write a weekly column for Entrepreneur Magazine about tips and tricks and advice for entrepreneurs. So if you guys have a pitch you want to send my way, um, on the side I have a startup that I work on part time called WeWire. I'm the founder CEO. It's a payment solution it's my product job for Africa. And, uh, um, pro Ethan, questions. he is co founder and head of engineering at Muesli. And Muesli is a startup that, works for me. that has raised over $25 million. <laughs> and Ethan, um, before that, was co-founder and CEO of UniU, a journaling app for your close friends and families. Um, and then Ethan also has a little bit of advice for you um, just along the process of ideation to launching your product. We're going to jump into that. Um, but yeah, I also noticed that Muesli had a name change. So, you know, just kicking things off with a little bit of a background on Muesli and what your product does, if you could jump in. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Um, so, uh, Muesli was, when, when we first launched, we are actually called Trustverse. So, uh, it's short for, it's, it's combined, in combination of trusted helpers. Um, when we first started, we are actually a, a, a tips and tricks app for, from experts, so trusted personal, uh, persons. That that, that, but the name was alluded to. Um, so we get uh, tips from uh, you know, uh, 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 home improvement experts, uh, local restaurants for like tour tips or uh, travel tips, and uh, also makeup uh, uh, artists that, uh, for, for beauty tips and makeup tips. So um, that's how we started. And uh, today, uh, name change to Muesli, which is really, uh, we're playing on the, uh, on the word Muse, which is your inspirations. And today we uh, sell uh, prescription skincare products. So that's, uh, that, that's, that's where the uh, name change came from. So you started things off with tips, tricks, and advice for people right. kind of saw that beauty was taking off right. in the skincare and makeup realm. And then you guys honed in on that 
Right, and exactly. Change the name, rebrand. So the the name might be very different, and the product may be very different. You know, it all happened over the year, over the last seven years. We've been building on um, Easley, and uh, it, it's it's to us, it's actually the, the transition or the pivots are actually very smooth. So we started with the you know tips of everything, and then we're honing on on beauty tips, which is you know the category that took off by far. Uh, uh, back then, and then you know, from building beauty tips, and then we started you know listening to our customer, customer asking, oh, how can I buy this product you were talking about in your tip? How can I buy that product? Then we build a marketplace for natural products um, for all the, the 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 brands that you can you can hardly find actually, or some of your brands they don't even have a website, so we would provide that solution for them. And after that, we we'll keep talking to our customers, listening to them, and then which led to, which is a, a, a stronger version of the product that, it, that they're looking for, which is harder to access, which requires prescription. So that's the, that's the solution that we're providing today. Excellent. Well, it seems like you guys have really done well, just building a strong foundation. And oftentimes, as we all know, that starts off with hiring the right people, but also creating a great team, environment, and culture that fits what the product is and how that's going to take form. So having people with good domain expertise, for example, um, what advice do you have for the audience to create an all-star high-performing team? An all-star high-performing team. Well, I think, you know, I think we can all agree to that. There's many, many traits uh, that one must look for to build an all-star team. But to me, uh, and uh, especially for startup, when it, in, in the context of startups, I think the most important trait, number one, is passion. And uh, passion comes really in two ways. Um, the individual that I'm looking for uh, has to be passionate about our mission, about what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, that's, that's very important, because that helps you to stay on course. Because just look at our own example from day one. You know, we have a, we have a mission, um, but the way to actually get there, the strategy constantly changes. And the passion about the mission actually helps you stay on course. And uh, regardless of the talent or experience that you have, if you can't stay on course, you're not going to get there. So that's why passion is important on the first, first half. The second half, um, they also have to be very passionate about what they actually do. So for an engineer is a bioengineer, or yeah. product, you know, um, a product guy will be building you know, uh, good products and marketing, so forth. Uh, you have to be very passionate about the, their own discipline. And the reason for that is very simple, because what you know today is certainly going to help as a good foundation, but what you end up doing uh, is going to change as, your, as, your, as the strategy changes. And you have to be passionate about your own discipline in order to stay up to date about what's the latest uh, product strategy or marketing strategy. Um, so that requires you to stay on course sometimes for quite a while. So if you're not passionate about what, uh, what you're actually practicing, then you may not be able to adapt and you will not perform so well. So passion is certainly the number one uh, uh, ranked uh, trait that I'll, I, I look for in my team. Yeah, and then another thing I might want to add on there is mm -hmm. uh, finding a diverse background. So Very even true. if you have, you have two engineers and a designer to start, maybe look for a designer who has a background in liberal arts or some other English background, right. for example. Right. That's a that's a very good point because um, I, I could I could speak to because I, I came from a, a, a computer science background. I'm an engineer myself. Um, we it, it's very important to include different people from different different disciplines uh, in your startup. Actually, Uni when we started, we um, that company uh, we had that company for two years and it was actually started by four engineers, me with three other people and. Um, we pivoted a couple times. We stick around for two years. Worked really, really hard. You know, seven days a week, and uh, didn't work so well because um, even though we were able to build a product, or what we call a product, an app, I actually probably on the app store, um, the app failed at uh, communicating to the consumers. It was a consumer. It was a consumer app. Um, and uh, in retrospect, I think you know, if we had designers or product, you know, person to help us, actually, that would be much, much better because. Um, even though at the time, still thinking back now, we thought we are able to come up with the UIs that's necessary to actually bring this product to the market. We 100% believe so, and fairly objectively too. However, the problem is we don't know what we don't know. And so, you know, we launched a product and we end up, uh, the product didn't do so well, and we, we thought that the idea wasn't so good. That could be just the way that you communicate. Right, how you write your 
what, what's, what, what's your brand? It could be the branding. So, um, and uh, because of what we don't, what we don't know, we don't know. Um, even though I think I may be qualified to actually launch this new product or new feature myself, I always try to include other people from different disciplines to give you perspectives because that's 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 the most valuable thing because you can at least see them and it can make your you know final judgment yourself. Yeah, and Vinod Kosla pushes this all the time. Uh, Peter Drucker management books it's like you have to hire generalists to start off, and then as you grow, 200 people plus, you're gonna be looking for specialists, um, you know, obviously looking for people who have marketing background, if Absolutely. you only have four engineers, would have been more helpful for Muesli, but hey, you guys are where you are now. <laughs> um, and then, of course, people often start with their friends. What do you do when you have a friend oh. you need to fire? Just kick him to the curb, or? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think when you have when you decide or when you realize someone it's time to fire someone, I think it's the time to do it, regardless if it's a friend or not. And especially for a friend, if actually you care about this friend, you should uh, part ways sooner rather than later. When you realize it's not the right fit, uh, for that reason, I would I would recommend not to not to if you have a choice, uh, uh, don't start a startup with your friend because it, it um, a startup requires a lot of different. Uh, a great many things uh, from both of you, which you may not be comfortable with, with your past experience. So um, when you realize someone is not performing at the level, um, especially at early stage, mm -hmm. you should um, have an upfront conversation with them. Tell them, hey, this is not working out, uh, and uh, you know it's for the best of the company, and just you should stop working with them because. Um, what makes or breaks the company are individuals, especially for startups at the very beginning stage. Right? Just one person that's not performing can kill the entire company. Not so true for Microsoft, for example, uh, um, but uh, it is very true for startups. Mm -hmm. um, if one guy, so a, a very easy example, four of the you know four, four guys working together. If one guy started um, you know all working eight hour, twelve hours every day, one day, one guy started taking vacations and. I don't know about the, what, what, what would the three other guys feel. It's just simple things like that could derail the entire company. So um, when you realize it's not right, you don't want to wait. Right. Right. And the next step is customer discovery. So you build the right team, and the top rule is simple. Talk to your customers, right? But we think we know our customers when we're building these applications. But the reality is, is that we don't. And we don't discover what you need to discover unless you go out there and talk to them. And when starting up your com company, what was that process like for you, listening to your customers? How did you determine this product was right? Um, specifically for Muesli, the dermatology prescription yeah. cosmetics. Sure. Um, so there's two parts to this question, I guess. Uh, the first part is um, where do we, how, how do we go about talking to the customer? I think talking to the customer is very, very important. And uh, you know, uh, which led to what we are today, actually, from day one. At the very beginning, we we're talking to our customers. That would that would be constructor, um, co contractors uh, from construction companies, or general contractors, or local business owners, restaurant owners, uh, and uh, makeup artists. And I talk to all of them to figure out what they want and what platform, what tool they need to express uh, 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 the tips or the expertise that they have, right? And to today. Um, we, we talk to, of course, dermatologists and also our, our, our users. What do they need and uh, what uh, actually value we can, we can add to the dermatologists that we talk to. Um, without going to the specifics, uh, I think it's very important to talk to people in different ways. So you want to talk to someone who's you know, online and offline, right? So offline will be your friends and family. Um, offline will be, for example, uh, 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 even just go into different dermatologists' uh, office and actually talk to them. Also, online, you can go into forums. Facebook groups will be great. Um, uh, we actually got into uh, uh, this uh, uh, dermatologist group on Facebook, which has like 2,000, 4,000 of them. So it was a, it was a great. So we posted, you know, proposed our idea, and we got a lot of uh, uh, introduction through that. So uh, definitely employ both online and offline. Um, and uh, strangers and uh, friends and fa friends and family in your strategy and talking to customers. The second question is, how do you know your product is a winning product? Well, the truth is we didn't know. Right? So, so we, when we launched the product, we, we, we think it solves at least one particular problem. But, but do we think it's the best product out there? Not really. But we launched it anyways because 
Um, even though we can talk to people before we launch the product, but we, what we really learn is after launching a product, that you, after you put yourself out there, and then um, you all of a sudden get to see, uh, get to hear much, much more than what you hear, and people are having genuine reaction to the product that they're actually using. Uh, I remember there was saying, I think it's from uh, Ray Hoffman, and uh, he said, uh, if you don't feel uh, disappointed or embarrassed uh, about your first product, that means you launched it too late. And that's how soon you should launch a product, because yeah. once you launch it, all of a sudden you have all these perspectives flushing in, yeah. um, and, and that's the time where you get the, so we didn't know. We launched it anyways, and then we learned, and we, we, we uh, iterated after that. Right, and that happens all the time with startups, so VCs often look for the right team in order to make that bet. So, for example, Muesli, it's, it's dermatologist, right. right? But at the same time, it's serving customers, so it's consumer facing, and the consumers are saying, we want clear skin. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right? It's not like they're saying, I want to talk to a dermatologist, even if they're saying, I need better access to dermatologists, what they're really saying is, I have acne, please clear my skin, right? Right, right, and right. And so you might not need a dermatologist to right. get that clear skin, you just need to have access to a prescription. Right. Because often what the dermatologists do is they just prescribe it, right. you try it for a month, right. if it doesn't work, they prescribe something else. Exactly. Right, so you're kind of automating, you're kind of cutting the, derm I mean, I don't want to speak for your product, <laughs> but oftentimes what technology does is it cuts out the middleman, right? Right, right, right. And that, that's, very, that's very true, because our customers are really looking for, you know, what are the best anti-aging products out there. Oh, even if that's um, what they're saying. Right, so how do you listen saying, if, right. if your customers are saying one thing, but you yeah. need to listen through what they're saying exactly. and do this deep listening in order to actually build a product that they want. Because it's Absolutely. like, I hear that, it's like a psychologist who says, I hear you're saying this, but what you're really saying is you have issues with your father, right? So it's right. that kind of thing. How do you do that? Right, so, so you know, continuing with this example, I think is a great example, is that our, when we talk to our customers with regular skincare products, which you know, we sell, um, what they're asking for is, hey, you know, there's a lot of them actually mention this particular product that they get from their dermatologist, which is very, very effective, but it's very expensive. You know, talking to a dermatologist is very expensive, so they're asking, how can we talk to our dermatologist for cheaper? And we actually talked to dermatologists, it's actually true, they can't make it cheaper in any way. So we were thinking, you know, how can we make seeing dermatology cheaper? But that's actually the wrong path. Our customer actually don't actually want to see dermatology, they don't actually need to see dermatology. Well, they, they do need in order to get a prescription drug, but what they are actually asking for is the access to this particular medication, uh, skincare medication that they need, that they found to be effective. Um, so we worked with a compound uh, uh, pharmacy to actually compound this particular medication and also have a pool of uh, nurse pr practitioners and dermatologists who actually have the capacity to actually prescribe or to review these, uh, these uh, uh, patients and uh, at the same time. So at the end, what we're doing is providing access, a cheaper access to the medications that they're already looking for. Um, uh, so that's the, by, by using telemedicine. So that's our current model. But that's, you can see that how that's different than where, that, where they're asking for, which was how can I see my dermatologist for cheaper? Yes. They actually don't want to see. No. It's quite the contrary. Yeah, exactly. So can you just, can you just feel that tension, like this <laughs> problem being solved, right? This is what goes into building winning products, is really solving the problem by listening to what right. people are actually saying when they're not telling you anything related. Um, going beyond uh, following a product blueprint and developing that solid plan, one thing you've strategically established is almost certainly not going to be the exact route that your product development process follows. Right. Things are going to change along the way. They always do. Um, what advice do you have for, for that change and just rapidly in iterating right. your product development process? Well, I think it's having the pers or having the right mindset when you go in, before you actually go into this long journey. Well, mm -hmm. realizing it is going to be a long journey. It's going to be a marathon where you have to change course multiple times. Recognize that it's 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 most likely going to happen. Um, that pre prepares yourself for that. So don't think that this is the idea. Even though when you're going, usually you think this is the idea. It's going to be the you know next unicorn building. 
but realize that that's going to, more, more often than not, that's going to change, so realize that. And so focus on finding uh, passionate individuals to work with from different disciplines, I think is very important, because that helps you stay on course. So the strategy change doesn't really matter, that's the pivot, but your mission is still the same. Or sometimes the mission could even change for certain companies. So having a, a team from different disciplines is very important. And, um, and uh, talk to your customers, that's, that's the most valuable asset. Um, be it your individuals, consumers, or businesses, talk to them. Trying to listen deeply, trying to understand what they're you know, uh, really trying to say, what's the real problem they're facing. And um, last, but, you know, uh, last advice is stick to it. And sometimes it, it, it takes longer, it, it, it may be harder, uh, but um, maybe the next turn is, is, uh, is what you're looking for and how, how you can get there. So, um. 100%, and that's what venture capitalists are looking for. So be sure to be able to communicate your larger vision um, so that everyone can see the possibilities, what you want to accomplish beyond just your product prototype that you're demoing to raise money. Um, be open for change. That pretty much wraps it up for our winning products talk. I hope you guys had some learning lessons out of this, and we will be around. So thanks so much, Nima, and thank you to Ethan. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. All right, so uh, we have the pitch competition next. Um, we had a few hundred applications, and then we, as a team, decide. We usually pick six or seven teams. This year, we picked six. Um, and the format is that in the morning, they get three minutes uh, of pitching and um, five minutes of Q&A. The Q&A, um, Armando, Armando, why don't you come up? Uh, Armando and I are going to drill them with questions for about five minutes, and then you guys vote, and the top three teams then uh, get to pitch the investor panel in the afternoon, and then the winners pick. Armando, you want to uh, give a quick intro about your background sure. and why you're here? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm first and foremost an operator. I co-founded and sold a couple of companies, the latest of which was Ad Espresso, uh, which uh, we sold to Hootsuite. You may have heard of them. They are the largest social media manager um, solution out there. Um, very, very good outcome. So, you know, everyone's very happy. Uh, I'm also an angel investor. I invested in about 75 companies at this point. So I'm really at the intersection between being an operator and being uh, an investor. As an operator, my background is essentially the COO profile. So uh, what I'm excited about and interested in, where I spend the vast majority of my time, is how you build and scale organizations uh, around products that work. Uh, and really, my superpower, uh, if you, you know, had to think about what, what the intersection of what I do, is between product marketing on one side, BCD, so business and carp dev, on the other, and then you know, uh, operations and growth, of course. So excited to be here, uh, and let's get this started. Okay, so uh, holistic air. So again, three minutes, three slides, uh, really quick. We're gonna ask some questions, and then you guys get to vote. Hello everyone, my name is Maria Lee and I am a founder of Holistic Care. The face mask industry has a market size of over $2.7 billion and is on track to grow to over $4 billion by 2022. And that's because 9 out of 10 people live in areas that are affected by bad air quality. The face mask is their only defense against outdoor air pollution. In India, China, and other parts of the world, wearing a mask is a part of daily life. 4.7 million people die from outdoor air pollution every year. 76% of the masks on the market don't actually work. And that's because three out of four people wear them incorrectly. They look easy enough to put on. But unfortunately, if the mask isn't sealed properly on your face, fine dust particles can still get in. And even if you do get it on right, the high levels of carbon dioxide trapped inside your mask 
is also dangerous. That's why we created Respire, the first ever wearable device that protects you from the inside of your mask, ensuring that your mask can protect you from the outside. Holistic Air's Respire is one of those devices that will change the mask industry. It is small, lightweight, easy to use. It tells you if your mask is sealed properly, and it alerts users when they've reached unhealthy levels of carbon dioxide. Finally, giving people access to data that can help save lives. Our prototype currently is going undergoing user tests, and the results are really great. We're here today to ask for your help in getting Respire into the hands of mask users everywhere. This way, we can educate and save lives together. Our team won first place in the Seoul Hardware Hackathon this past March. We've also been awarded um, support from the Korean government in the form of grants and multiple accelerator programs. Our crowdfunding campaign starts this fall, and if it's successful, will become our gateway into markets all over the world. We hope that you'll vote for our team, Team Holistic Air, and help us continue to innovate so that we can make the world a more livable place. Thank you very much. So thank you uh, for being here. A couple of questions. Yes. What is the product actually? Is just the, the detector or is the, the whole mask? No, it's actually a small device that you can apply to any type of mask that you want. So, um, unfortunately, in Asia and other parts of the world, wearing a mask is part of fashion right. because you have to wear it so often. And so we decided to create just the device that you can apply to any type of mask so that it's interchangeable. And oftentimes, masks also have to be um, replaced mm -hmm. because the filters get dirty. So this way, you can keep using this device for a long time. So essentially, you buy the device, and then there is an app on your phone that helps you track what's happening. Yes. Is that right? Yes. The app tells you if your mask is sealed, which is incredibly important. Otherwise, your mask is useless. Right. And then it also tracks, over a course of time, how much carbon dioxide you've inhaled. Because carbon dioxide, in general, is not bad for you. But over long periods of time, the high levels that you're wearing the mask for can be really dangerous, it can even result in heart attacks for people that um, have heart diseases or respiratory diseases. Mm -hmm. How long have you been working on this? We just started in March, so we've been oh, nice. going really fast. Our engineers are um, working on improving our prototypes so we can actually take it to um, manufacturing. Uh -huh. And so this fall, we're going to start our crowdfunding campaign. Awesome. And in terms of monetization model, how are you guys thinking about it? Um, selling the device, you mean? Yeah price point and you know oh. how the business model works do you guys have you know some early data around it or still something that needs to be discovered right we've already looked at um, pricing in terms of creating the device and um, for retail market uh, we're thinking about $79 per unit it can be used for long periods of time it's relative to the price of most masks that you have on the market right now uh, the cost of creating device is probably about six dollars per unit. Okay. Yeah. And then, is there a recurring model in terms of like getting data from the app or additional services that you can get from the app? Absolutely. I mean, that's that's our whole goal is to continue to innovate so that it can do more things. Mm -hmm. um, and that long-term data isn't really being collected by anybody. So um, I believe that that information will be extremely useful for people. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And one of the things that may be interesting for the audience, and I'm curious about as well, um, when it comes to different geographies, how do you guys think about it? In the sense that I can see, like for Asia, this being a very strong need. How do you think about Europe? Or how do you think about the US or North America in general? Well, we're very lucky here in the United States. <laughs> in South Korea, where I, I live, we've just come here for this conference, um, there's only about 45 days of clean air. All other days, oh. our sky looks like this. It's gray. It's really quite incredible. Um, in Los Angeles, where I grew up here in the Bay Area, <laughs> we, we grew up thinking 
It was the worst smog problem in Los Angeles. But in Los Angeles, it's still over 300 days of clean air, right? right? So, and Seoul doesn't have the worst quality air in the world. It's up there, but you've got India, you've got China, Chi right. Beijing and Shanghai. So those are also great markets for us too. Um, in terms of Europe, I think this could also be a product that could be useful there too. Mm -hmm. And when you say Asia, 45 days of clean air, does that apply to big cities only or to which extent even like smaller uh, geographies or areas can be impacted by this? Oh, we're talking about the whole peninsula. Okay. The whole peninsula. A lot of the air, depending on who you ask, some people say it blows over from China, but um, there's also a lot of coal production in mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. So assuming the strong go-to-market and focus, at least initially, is going to be in Asia for you guys. That's where we'd like to start. The reason why we chose Korea, not just because I live there, is mm -hmm. because Korea creates a lot of great healthcare products. Um, there's a lot of credibility in it. So as compared to creating a product in China and selling it, I think it's a lot more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, the Chinese love Korean products. Um, India, they like Korean products. So um, we just think it's a great way to start there. Yeah. A couple more questions uh, from my side. So one, go to market. How are you thinking about reaching your potential customers if you, you know, put some thoughts around that already? So, I mean, our initial thought right now is to start our crowdfunding campaign this fall. And part of that is marketing, right? So um, getting it out there, getting users using it, having them give us great feedback, hopefully. <laughs> And um, that will, time is up, uh, but <laughs> yeah. that will hopefully help us expand to other parts of the world as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great. Okay, my buddy AI. Hello. My name is Ivan. I'm the co founder and CEO of My Buddy AI, and we're building the voice based AI English tutor for kids. We help children practice spoken English by talking with a virtual AI-powered character, just like they would talk with human tutor. So, meet Buddy. Oh. Hello, Ivan. Hi, Buddy. How are you? I'm great, and you? I'm great, thank you. Do you want to play dinosaurs? I'm, I'm a bit busy now. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye. So, you see there are like uh, 500 million children are trying to learn English every year, including 20 million immigrant children here in the U.S., like, like my daughter, Sophia. And uh, the problem is only a tiny percentage of these children are able to reach fluency because of a lack of speaking practice. Of course, there are like tons of English learning apps and websites, but it turns out that the only way to practice speaking online is through tutoring platforms that connect children and teachers via video conferencing, and they charge 20 to $25 per lesson, which is like too expensive for most families, right? So to solve this problem, we've developed a natural language processing technology, which enables us to provide 90% of uh, human tutoring instruction at only 2% of the cost. Uh, we launched a year ago and already generated over $160,000 in subscription revenue. We are growing 20% month over month with positive unit economics, and so we made $24,000 in May, and we already made $20,000 $20, in June, so growing pretty fast. Uh, we're a small team of only four people, but we have the experience of building powerful voice-first products. Before my buddy, I worked at Cubic AI, where we built an Amazon Echo Lite smart speaker, and it was acquired by, by Yandex. Uh, and uh, so now we are raising $1.2 million uh, to reach 1 million ARR early next year, advance the product, and build mar partnerships with schools and device manufacturers. So join us on a mission, and I hope our children, the next generation, will be able to really speak to each other. Thank you. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Wanna start, or wanna make a... Uh, sure, oh, sorry. So obviously, a uh, crowded space. Um, how do you envision kind of this idea of partnerships uh, 
you know, it's not easy to get uh, a device manufacturer to preload your app, but uh, how do you envision your... So actually, uh, the space looks crowded, uh, and there are tons of loading apps, but uh, we, so n no one is actually focused on, on speaking practice because it's like super hard thing. So a lot of apps offer pronunciation training, but none of them is focused on speaking practice. It's the first thing. And the secondly, so we focus on children. And in, in, in this space, we only compete with one company, actually. We have only one like a strong competitor, which is a game, and they don't have like a voice at all. What's the name of the company? Uh, it's Lingo Kids. Okay. Yeah, so about partnerships, so we already signed the partnership for 200,000 pre-installs with the manufacturers of comp compact projectors. It's called Cinemode, and we're also talking with, uh, uh, with manufacturers of uh, tablets for kids in, in Mexico. Okay, so one question from my side to just narrow down a second the target customer. Uh, you were talking about alpha million, oh, sorry, 500 million kids, yeah. um, you're thinking not every kid, but kids from immigrants in the, into the United States or kids from abroad the United States that want to learn English or like kids in general? You know, it's fair to say that like every child on the planet learn English, you know, like 99 and 99, 99%. Like uh, in, in China, Russia, Korea, we, uh, children learn English as a foreign language and in the US, Right. Children just learn English as, as, a, as their main primary language. So our main focus is now on, uh, on the children who learn English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. So most of our users today are from Europe mm -hmm. and Korea. How many users do you have right now? We have around 3,000 3, paying subscribers and around 30,000 monthly active users. Wow, okay. And we have 27,000 user reviews with more, with and almost all of which are five-star ratings. Awesome. Um, business model, so how does it work? So currently we charge uh, $8 uh, for, as a week, for a weekly subscription. Okay. Uh, but we, most of our users prefer $50 like, per annual plan, so, so they prepay. Right. Uh, yeah, but we are constantly experimenting with prices, mm -hmm. and it's not like a final pricing, so we, we run A-B tests like every week. Okay. Um, another question from my side, talking about business model and kids. Um, this can be a fairly delicate topic in the sense that, you know, you want to be careful around, you know, how uh, add-ons are purchased on kid apps, and this is, you know, something that people are always very sensitive about. Sure. Uh, how do you think about it? That's why we, we prefer subscription. Okay. So you, you subscribe once, and then we do not try to upsell you anything. Okay. How do you train the, uh, the language, how, how, the training model? What do you use? Is a, do you work with uh, psychiatrists or uh, educators? Uh, like, are you talking about curriculum or AI part? I guess both. Uh, so for AI part, we gather like ton of tons of data. So last year, we, we had like a million minutes of conversations. So it's a lot of data uh, to, to, to train our AI. And about the... Uh, the curriculum part, so we have two PhDs, one in psychology and the other one is in education sciences, who are working with us on, the, well, on learning plan and curriculum, yeah. And talking about content, so, you know, to have a weekly or even an annual subscription, you have to keep the content fresh, right? How, how do you think about it? How does that work within your app? So we, we uh, we built, we call it like a content machine, so when, we, when you have AI, you can uh, reuse a lot of your co content. So basically, uh, a lot of things that, uh, that children do in our app now is like uh, vocabulary and pronunciation. And once you learn the word, then you have to, uh, to really remember it. You need to uh, repeat it like for multiple times, and we, we use like, uh, so yeah, you, you, you so, so now we have an, a lot of content for, so we have enough content for a year already, okay. but it's still an MVP, like 1% of what we want to build, and so that's one of the reasons we are raising money now, so uh, to advance the product. Okay, and how do customers find about you? Or parents of? 60% of our users, we've, uh, we acquire
require via Facebook and Google Ads, and 25% is like word of mouth referrals. Okay. Uh, all other is like search, and um, uh, we've been featured on the App Store like a, a, a lot of times. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. All right, Nicholas, Pali Club. Hi, everybody. I'm Nicolas Mandiara. I'm the founder of Palette Club. So wine is a very crazy, huge market, 360 billion worldwide. And it is very confusing with a lot of frictions. It's a market where 100,000 wineries bring to the market a million different labels and products every year to a billion con consumers who don't understand them. Adding to the confusion, wine has become way more expensive, outgrowing inflation by three times in the past 20 years. Moreover, you have absolutely no innovation on the retail side of wine, particularly tackling the main problem of wine is matching your personal taste and understanding your personal taste. So we created a complete new service, which is experience-based, explaining your personal profile with a digital taste. So it's basically wine learning in a fast track. We made it very easy and simple to customize your subscription. And we added a lot of wine learning features, such as videos of the winemakers of the wines you receive. But before anything else, we match wine to your personal taste. So how we do that is with the help of 12 PhDs, wine experts, we've created a unique data science model around taste and wine using more than 200 traits found in, uh, in wine. And we use blind tasting. That enables us basically to figure out your personal taste and then ship wines according to your specific taste. Uh, we have launched last year as an app. We now have very strong traction, growing 40% a month. Uh, June is probably going to be 60% growth. The best news is that the customers are very sticky. We have very low churn. Actually, every month our churn is going lower. And ratings go up. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's growing fast. We have multiple layer strategy in marketing. We do online as well as, off, as well as offline with retail. We have a very specific blind tasting box to start with. And the team is a team of professionals of uh, online e-commerce. I myself built four companies before, a $100 million e-commerce business before that, and a very strong CTO uh, of, uh, who is like a specialist on machine learning and data science. Thank you. So, uh, great presentation, thank you. Uh, I have so many questions around these numbers. Um, okay. Thank you for showing them. Uh, so, let's start with one easy one. So, to understand a little bit better the user experience, it seems like you have two things going on in your app. On one side, you have a subscription. On the other side, people rate um, bottles or like brands of wine. Is that accurate? Yeah, so the way it works, it's a B2C model. The subscription is based only on the wines you choose. You choose a price range, you choose basically uh, how many whites, etc., cetera, and, and the frequency, and that's the subscription. You can change any time. So the average basket right now is about $1,000 a year. So okay. with strong margins, because wine business has strong margins. The main experience starts with a blind tasting box, which is four half bottles. We only use half bottles for the beginning to make it faster. Uh -huh. So they're wrapped by a tissue like this, mm -hmm. and they have numbers. So you start with one, two, three, four, and the customer only has to rate them from one to five. And because the wines are polarizing and because we entered more than 30 data points per bottle, uh, we figure out, we build your first profile right after that. The good part of that is that we figured the experience is very fun for people, so they do it with their friends, and we start to see there's a big word of mouth effect, which also goes into lowering our customer acquisition cost. Gotcha. And I receive bottles every, how often? Every week, every month? So uh, the um, average subscription is 1.5 months, so every okay. six weeks, uh, and the average basket is $117 okay. per shipment. 
Okay. So the shipments arrive, so the gamification continues because you receive different numbers based on what we found out on your profile. As you continue to rate, your profile gets more accurate. So your digital taste basically is shown. Uh -huh. And that could be applied to many other things, not only wine. So the, 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 the end game of this might be to go beyond wine and sell all sorts of premium foods and beverage based through blind tasting, but on your profile. OK. And then moving on to churn. That's a very low churn figure. Yes, uh, the industry product. has usually a much higher churn. How uh, does that happen? It's like between 10 and 20 percent. Right. Well, I think there's two reasons. W one is uh, what the customer gets by every time he rates balls, his profile updates, he gets classical wine regions matched. He always learns more. Mm -hmm. And the second reason is, is that we focused only on quality and premium segment, as opposed to most of the market, uh, which did a lower range. So it's $17 a bottle to 60. So that enables us to sell very good wine curated and then match to your taste. We can see that the customers are happy because the average rating goes up at every shipment on average. So basically, the technology works. OK. And so registered profiles versus monthly sessions, that's about like four sessions per registered user on average per month. Y yes, well, that's a mix, of course, of new users coming right. in. And, and there would be you know, power law distribution, so there would be power users which will be more yes. engaged, and then people that would be less engaged. Do they come back? on a weekly-ish basis just to rate bottles, or is so, there something else? So one third of our subscribers are power users, which come about once a week every time they actually drink a bottle of, of one we ship. Then we have one third who come about once a month. And okay. then we have one third who do almost not using the product. And this is what we are trying to do now, because when they're using the product, they don't leave. The only guys who leave are those who are not using it. So. We are, we are working a lot on tutorials right now, so to, 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 make, to explain the product, to all the benefits of having value of the wine. To make it uh, very simple, our pitch to the customers is if you go randomly in a wine store and you choose a $20 bottle of wine, you have a 10% chance to have a good value bottle which matches your taste. Right. And with Palette Club, that number goes to 90%, basically. So that's the, uh -huh. the value for the customer. Do you act as a wholesaler, or how? So, uh, we, you know, there's a lot of regulations in wine. So we have import, wholesale, and online retail license. So we import, we buy from wineries directly, and we sell directly to the customer, cutting basically all the wholesale and retail uh, distribution. And the, <laughs> the so I'm not going to go into the details, but the Supreme Court rules today about online retail. Oh. Uh, so there's ways to avoid in certain states, but it might happen that today they oblige all states uh, in the United States to, uh, to accept interstate shipping, which will make us grow faster, basically. So time is up, but one super quick question. So 10K in May 2019, 200K by end of this year, that's a very aggressive goal. How uh, are you going to do that? Yeah, well, we, uh, so we are growing 50% a month. Uh, this month is 60%. We are opening new channels and big partnerships this summer. So our growth is going to go way, way higher. And particularly, we just received our beautiful box to start with, and that is opening gifting platforms, and it's opening retail as well, which are, for, for us, they are zero customer acquisition costs. Okay. So we can push it as much as we want. So, uh, yeah, and also the channels that work right now, we're opening 10 new states this summer, and we were only shipping to California. Just, just because of that, uh, just when we acquire, like right now, about five to six subscribers a day, just by opening new states by September, that number is going to be 20, 25 per day, ju just with the same channels. So more channels and widespread in geography that will make us grow probably even higher than this. But I don't like to show. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Okay, perceive. Okay, good job. Thank you. I know everybody wants to get to lunch, so we'll make this really effective and just vote for us. So, <laughs> what perceive is about is my name is Karen Soleil, and I'm the co-founder of Perceive. And what we do is we do spatial intelligence. We enable companies to be able to relive their visitors' experience.
Today, companies are, have this insatiable need for data. They just can't get enough of it. And to be honest, we actually, as individuals, feed it. So each day, we give companies over 50 gigs of information for them to mine, to utilize. What's happening today, though, is there's legislation that's coming about and saying, guess what, you can't have all of that. So companies are looking elsewhere. How can I get that same data but somewhere else? And that place is in the physical world. If I go to a store, if I'm at a co-working, if I'm in manufacturing, I still can find out information about the visitor. But today it only sits here at five gigs. So companies have sat and they've said, we'd like you to come and create new technology, new ways of thinking about this that will actually take that five gig of data to 50 gig. And so that's exactly what Perceive has done. Perceive has said, we're going to create an anonymous way for people to interact with their data. And we do this by a computer vision engine that allows people to gather the information, how people are behaving, what are they doing, and then we don't just leave it in a dashboard. We actually allow you to have a VR interactive experience with your data. So what does that look like? That looks like I'm a co-working space and all of a sudden everyone's leaving at two o'clock. I see anomaly on my dashboard today they have no idea, they're just guessing. But with Perceive, you can click on that and you're launched directly into a VR experience where you're the avatar and you can look at what's happening. And you can realize that Dandelion Chocolate is having a sale. So every, at two o'clock, they give away their samples. So everyone's going to the, getting the samples and then coming back. So as a co-working place, you could invite Dandelion in and realize that information so what Perceive is doing is we're changing the way businesses deal with analytics. We're making it an interactive 3D experience. Thank you. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm not sure I understood whether this is a B2C play or a B2B play. Who's your customer? Our customers are in different verticals. The different verticals would be retail. It's a B2B play. Retail, okay. public institutions, uh, which would be a museum, would be a library. Uh, we also work as far as workplaces, manufacturing. So any commercial space would be a customer. Okay. And their goal as B2B entities would be to sell So more, the goal or? for the b so if I'm a museum, my goal is to improve my customer interaction, so my visitor. Okay. So what I would do is I would track uh, what pictures are people looking at so I can actually drive additional um, value coming in. If I'm a co-working space, I want to drive people's satisfaction, so I need to understand, do I have enough co-working desks for them to sit at? Do I have enough places for them to stand? So how people use their environment, you can actually drive better customer satisfaction, so you increase your revenue and reduce your cost. Okay, and you sell the hardware as well on top of the software, I'm assuming. Uh, we do both. We can leverage existing cameras, or we okay. can also implement our own cameras. So it's camera based, pretty much. Pardon? It, it is camera based. Okay. And so we have um, raised over a million dollars from the NSF and have um, production version product that is also certified as well as an AI um, computer vision engine. How far along are you with that? Like how much? You so, know? so we are in production and okay. we're at the ninth largest museum. And so we have um, beachheads in cities beachhead in public institutions, and a beachhead in workplaces. So you have a few pilot customers. We have actually, um, we're past the pilot stage, and we're actually in paid implementation. Oh, okay. How much are they paying you? Uh, the retail price is 20000 but we've discounted it, uh, 20, 20K a year, but we've okay. discounted in exchange for a logo, customer reference, okay. as well as case studies. How do you define success? And how do your customers, your you know, initial customers define success? Our initial customers define success by, defi by um, understanding their environment. So for example, the museum, 
They currently don't know how many people are in their galleries. And okay. so what they want to do is target the gallery owner for additional donation. So by being able to send an email directly to them to say, we've had so much excitement in your gallery, Mr. Very Big Donor Check. Um, we had 400 people in. They love the Cezanne. Uh, we're looking to have a special exhibit. Would you like to sponsor that? Mm -hmm. And today they can't do that. So it's a better way to measure foot traffic, like sim simplifying and dumping it down to some degree. It, it does foot traffic, but it, it goes beyond that because um, what are they looking at? Okay. What are they interacting with? So I can tell if I'm looking at a, if I'm actually looking at a picture, mm -hmm. if I'm in a co-working space, I can see if I'm sitting or I'm standing. How are you actually dealing with your environment? But more importantly, it's really being able to have an avatar go in and look at their whole experience and being able to experience um, past historical video data through an avatar's eyes. Okay. Does it also send like a notification in a sense if it sees an anomaly or? Absolutely, so we do notifications as well as workflow. For irregularities? Yes. And then does it, does it learn as far as patterns? In the case of retail, I'm assuming that um, Someone, if someone's looking at the sweater, then they might also buy these boots. How, how does it understand those correlations or does it learn? Yes, so it is a computer vision and AI engine, so it does learn. Um, in addition to that, what it, it also has the analytics on top of it, so you can ask questions to it as well. So you have a, how many initial customers you said? Five, six? We have about 10. Okay. So about like 150 to 200 k in revenue? Uh, more or less. Okay, that's also interesting <laughs> information from an investment standpoint. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, so there is this whole wave of um, new you know, machine learning enabled video solutions for businesses. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that you know, people are starting to become more sensitive to and will be more and more as they realize they are recorded is you know, the privacy angle. Like how are they recorded and you know, which conditions and what's being done with you know, the data about themselves. Absolutely. How do you think about that? So that's actually our number one priority is anonymity. And so what we do is you actually have to actively identify someone's face. And so... Okay. What we do is that is not part of our algorithms. What we're interested in is more is the behavior component. Okay. And so we do not do any facial recognition. So um, similar to LiveRamp or other large data sets, they aggregate based upon characteristics, and right. that's what we do the same. So yeah, no PII data, so personally, personally identifiable information, and you're pretty much digitalizing the offline world interactions. Ab yeah. Absolutely. And okay. for us, what's really important is that we do this in the cloud and uh, we are working with different um, vendors to do 5G. And what that really does is it opens up the fact that all of this can be real time. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there was a problem in manufacturing, I could go real time into historical and be an avatar and look at the problems that are occurring. Okay. And that doesn't exist today. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. All right, Zen Sports. Thank clicker, you. Click, clicker, clicker. Oh, that would be good. That would be helpful. Hello, my name is Mark Thomas. I am the co-founder and CEO of Zen Sports. Most people, when they think of sports betting, they think of some big burly guy named Guido who's going to come to your apartment and knock your uh, kneecaps out uh, unless you pay off your gambling debts. Well, the reality is, is that sports betting is actually a $120 billion highly regulated industry worldwide. Even the United States, States, which is notoriously conservative when it comes to gambling and or sports betting. Recently, last year, the Supreme Court uh, authorized states to begin legalizing sports betting, and 12 states already have done so. But despite the fact that it's a highly regulated, huge industry, there still exists a ton of problems within the sports betting world, especially with online sports books. So let's say you're interested in placing a bet on this weekend's game. 
you find a pretty reputable online offshore sportsbook to place a bet with. First, you have to send your funds into that account. It's probably going to take anywhere from three to five days to get your account funded. Then you have to trust the fact that that sportsbook is actually going to pay you out when they say they will. And lastly, the house always wins, right? They only make money when you lose, which means they're always going to set the odds in their favor and against you. Well, here comes Zen Sports. We've built the only fully decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer mobile sports betting app where anybody with a few taps of a button can sign up, create an account, and create and accept bets with anybody else in the world. You get to set your own odds and terms for any kind of sports bet that you want. You want to bet that the Giants are going to win the World Series at 1,000 to 1 odds? Go for it. Even more fun? You want to bet that the Giants are going to wear their black unis this weekend? That's even more fun. You can do that also. And we make it super easy to deposit funds using cryptocurrencies and credit cards where you get your account funded in minutes. Oh, and we're the only approved mobile app for sports betting on the app and Play Store. In just a couple of months since launching, we've achieved several regulatory and other uh, KPI uh, traction metrics. Uh, on the regulatory side, we've uh, obtained several international licenses that allow us to inter uh, operate internationally. We have also uh, are in the process of uh, receiving US-based licenses as well that will allow us to operate here. And as I mentioned, uh, we're one of the only uh, uh, mobile sports betting apps in the App and Play Store. Uh, again, in just a couple months since launching, uh, we've had over 4,000 bets that have been uh, accepted and created. Uh, we're actually doing now over 150,000 in betting volume per month. Uh, our customer acquisition cost is really low, and customers are actually spending quite a bit of money with us. And our average payback on our customer acquisition cost is uh, very quick as well. So we're currently raising a $1.5 million seed round, of which 250000 of it is already closed. Uh, definitely come talk to me if you want to be part of the exciting future world of sports betting. Again, my name is Mark Thomas from Zen Sports, and I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I'll start. Um, so I'm curious about, so the regulation is a big, like huge part of this. So I um, want to double click a second and talk about the international licenses that you were mentioning about. Yeah, so let's forget about the United States for a second because it's a whole other animal. Each state is almost like its own country when it comes to regulatory for sports betting. Um, so we have a Coracell license, which allows us to operate in approximately over 70 countries. Uh, we have another 25 countries that look at us as skill-based gaming since we are peer-to-peer -peer, um, and we are not a bookmaker uh, at all. Uh, we are close to obtaining a UK gaming license, uh, which we should have this summer, which will allow us to operate in most European countries. Uh, and then we are actually seeing a really huge uh, influx of uh, customers from Africa um, because not all of them have laptops, but they all have smartphones. Um, and so they may not be able to use traditional bookmakers because uh, they don't have a laptop to go online, but they do have their smartphone. Um, so we're in the process of also obtaining some African licenses too. Uh, so we're moving pretty quickly on that front uh, on, the, on the regulatory side of things. You, you, I think you mentioned uh, average value of the customer is $450? Uh, per year. That's the fees that we receive. So we charge an average of 3% for all bets that get created in our app. Um, so the actual real volume uh, that customers are doing uh, is approximately $15,000 a year in betting volume, which is about uh, $450 a year in fees that we collect. The lister of the bet pays the fee? Uh, both the lister and the acceptor. So we charge 2% to the maker uh, for creating a bet and 4% to the taker for accepting a bet. So we give you a slight price break if you add liquidity to the marketplace, and we charge a little bit more if you remove liquidity from the marketplace, similar to any kind of other trading platform that you might see out there. Yeah, the big one is Betfair, right, out there when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer betting. But even Betfair still has components of a bookmaker. Uh, right. They're still a bookmaker. We are not. We, in fact, don't even get involved in the submitting of results. The uh, betting marketplace actually handles submitting of results. And we have a full penalty and reward system in place to make sure that everyone acts in good faith. Mm -hmm. Can a, uh, a bet be accepted by multiple people? Yes, absolutely. So again, it's very similar to a trading platform. You create a bet for $100. One person could accept it for $100. Uh, 20 people could accept it for $5 each. Minimum bet's a dollar, so it could be up to 100 people that accept it for a dollar each. Uh, one question around the, the blockchain element, right? Uh, we hear a lot about blockchain companies these days. What is it that makes, you know, blockchain necessary for what you're doing and kind of irreplaceable. Right. 
So I didn't really talk too much about that. Right now, we are semi-decentralized in the fact that we are not a bookmaker or getting involved in the making or taking a bets right now at all. But our app is not yet built on smart contracts on the blockchain. They're still on our own servers. Eventually, we want to make this fully decentralized and put this on the blockchain. We really believe that betting and gaming is one of the first best use cases of blockchain because it creates a truly trustless and transparent system where everyone can see what's going on. So the, the move is going to be in the next six to 12 months to take a lot of the existing uh, betting contracts that people create within our app and move those to smart contracts on the blockchain. Okay. okay. Those uh, 4,000 customers I think you mentioned? Uh, we have a, a few thousand users of okay. which we have about uh, 125 or so paying customers. Where, where are they? How did they find about you? And how do you see you know, customer acquisition scaling you know, 10x where you are? Right, so we've, we're, we basically spent nothing on marketing up to this point. That's a big part of what we'll be using this funding for. Uh, right now, it's almost all uh, fully word of mouth. We're doing a lot of content marketing. For example, we are providing tips and calls and betting uh, uh, expertise as well as sports tips out there uh, and driving a lot of content that way. Uh, in fact, we actually feel there's a big opportunity to create a subscription business around that content, and we plan on doing so in the next couple of months as well. Um, but right now, our customer acquisition cost is almost entirely word of mouth. We're doing a couple of Facebook ads, which is why we actually do have an actual customer acquisition cost, um, but we're only spending about $1,200 a month on marketing right now. And where do you see like the vast majority of the customers coming from in terms of geographic? Uh, yeah, so geography, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Australia are our three biggest ah. markets. Okay. Europe is a pretty saturated, mature market. Uh, we will probably expand there at some point, but we're really kind of focused on emerging markets where there's not a lot of good technology companies already right. servicing them. And probably like uh, an angle to this is also the, the fact that you guys are mobile first. So for those area, for those regions, you know, it's more interesting, something that's mobile first versus that. Yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Flo. Our last one. I get the opportunity of being last. I'm Jason Marsh, and the company is Flow Immersive, and we're building a spatial communication platform. And it's all live demos today. Let's hear it for some live code, right? Woo. So yeah. So let's dig right into what is PowerPoint. What's why it's a, is it a problem? So. 30 million PowerPoints are supposedly delivered every single day. I'm sure there's a lot of Prezi's and other slideware delivered as well. The problem is it doesn't stick. If you take an image and put it in front of somebody's visual cortex and it disappears and you do it again and again and again, you're, it violates your brain's natural way of organizing information. Turns out we organize our information spatially using this little thing called our hippocampus. So the hippocampus is this little organ in our brain. It gives us our spatial awareness, and it's tied directly to our memory. Think about a mouse running through a maze, thinking about a mouse finding its food in the real world. If you're familiar with something called the memory palace technique, it's a way to memorize a thousand digits of pi, right? So it turns out that if you take this content and we really are talking about enterprise content here. This is a, you know, a business environment. And you put it into a spatial environment using AR, augmented reality, or virtual reality. Now you've got something that will stick. So let's just say that Flow is a spatial communication platform for data storytelling. Let me talk about data real quick. So if you're going to do a great presentation, you need data today. Big data is a real challenge for, for our customers, for, for both financial services and the consultancies. So this is a quick example of um, just a little bit of a visualization from one of our biggest customers, which is BlackRock, which is using Flow both from a big screen presentation environment and putting it onto, our, onto phones every, in the audience as well as into, um, into VR. So real quick. We are, we've been in business about three years. We're an enterprise SaaS software company. We um, are looking to raise in order to take the solutions that we've built um, more into the head-mounted augmented reality space and um, also to um, advertise this more, uh, to execute on our marketing plan to extend our existing customer base. Thank you. So, I'll start. Go for um, it. Yeah. So, uh, Google just acquired Looker. Are you, was Looker a competitor? 
So that's exactly what this graph helps us to describe. So great first question, right? So we see ourselves more in the PowerPoint, in the communication space of data visualization than the data analysis space. When you see it on the screen, it may look kind of similar, but it's actually a totally different use case. How do you communicate more effectively? And you can tell that we're not just doing data, right? So that's, that's an important piece, of the, important piece of the puzzle. We're also, um, we have a f what we call the flow editor, which enables anyone to build these things. And even Looker is still really a tool for data scientists as opposed to everyday enterprise users. So for example, this presentation was built, most of it this morning, with the flow editor. Um, and you can see him, see him click around a little bit. How, how do you charge? Um, we're, as an enterprise SaaS software company, we have, a, of course, a, a subscription model for the editor and a professional services. So far, we have funded most of the business through customers doing professional services. And the flow editor is a new uh, addition. It's still beta, and we're only starting to charge for that. We, we think we have our first customer in uh, for the flow editor, but really we feel, still feel it's kind of beta. What's the, the price point on that? On the flow editor, the, for a small number of users, one to two users in an enterprise, um, we seem to be getting good feedback around $200 a month, but once you get up you know, beyond even five or six users, drop it down to more like $50 per month per user. So just to understand, you guys have been an enterprise as business before for the past three years, but this is the new product that you guys are launching. Or like... Y yes, well, okay. from day one, every line of code has been written in order to build a SaaS product, okay. but we have been funding it by using customers, okay. which is a great way to do it because oh, yeah. customers are going to tell you what, what's needed. For sure. And to build an editor before you know what it, the editor should be producing would have been a mistake. So. so you have an existing customer base, but this is a new product that you're launching soon, or it's already out there? It's already out there. Anybody okay. can go to flow.gl and sign up and play with it. Um, but we're not charging for it yet until, okay. until we feel like it's. So how many like beta customers are on this? Um, and how are you thinking about going to market? I'm assuming you know, you're going to use the existing customer base. How many customers is that? Uh, and talk about the go-to-market part a little bit. So we have, um, depending on uh, where you are in the customer cycle, we've got about eight paid customers today. Mm -hmm. um, but really, we don't think of, that's for service business. Right. And we don't think of those as one and done. Mm -hmm. We think of those as long-term uh, process. Like BlackRock is a really good example of that, actually, mm -hmm. for us. Um, but um, so, and then the, the um, tool, we have not marketed at all okay. still, and it's to feel it's early. We have hundreds of users, but like I say, they're not paid today. Okay. So what is, one thing I'm curious about is, what's the use case that you guys see emerging from a product like this, right? Because on one side, you're competing with slides. Uh, on the other side, you're competing with dashboards. And so, like, how is this position, and what's the best use case for something like this from an enterprise perspective? Well, let's hit the the broad vision, right? Which is, right now you're in a conference room in an enterprise, and you've got PowerPoint on a screen off to the side. Right. But what you really want to do is have that human connection, have that eye contact with the people around you. If we can take that this information and put it over the conference room table, or on the conference room table, and everybody can interact with it and work with it in its own, in that format, then that feels, that's, it's a totally different vision for how we communicate, mm -hmm. especially how we communicate those really hard problems that society needs to fix right now. Understand, being able to step into the data, understand the details, be able to step out to see the full context. We, saw it, we call it saying, seeing the forest and the trees at the same time. Right. So you're betting big, essentially this is, you know, at the intersection of PowerPoint and Tableau for the AR enabled world. Would that, be that, is, that is true. And, and I would admit today that we're in VR, with a, just a VR environment, right. and a flat screen environment, that we're a little ahead of the market. Right. But BlackRock is using it on a big screen, on phones with little clip-ons. Huh. How many in users? In full audiences. 
and in VR in, in an advanced situation. How many users do BlackRock have on this? Or like, what are some of the success KPIs that you guys are measuring with them? Still early. Okay. Um, so, so we uh, shipped our, the first version of the first event was in February. They are giving it in large scenarios now, um, including Shanghai. And they have trained 100 in the last couple of weeks. They've trained 100 financial advisors to use these with their phones with investors. So it's too early to have those metrics. OK. Thank you. Cool. Thank awesome. you. Good. All right. Wanda, that was pretty cool, right? Yeah, it was fun. Well, hope you All guys right. enjoyed so, it. So uh, you guys get to vote. The top three teams come back in the afternoon and pitch the investor panel. Instructions are here. Choose well. Choose well. And it's basically which company has the highest chance of success. That's kind of the measure. Are you going to vote? Are going to vote? Oh, yeah. Let me see. You just get one, you get one vote, and the top three go on to the... We'll emerge from the group, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, the code is that one, 67, 21, 15. Oh, real-time updates. Look at that. I don't like it. <laughs> it influences people. A little bit. Let's cover it. <laughs> uh, we have a tie for third place. Oh, uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Tie for third place. <laughs> All right, come on. We can wrap up, and then uh, you'll you'll know who who won. Uh, All right, we're gonna take a break. Uh, sandwiches and lunch in the other room. So wait a second. If that's it. Uh, is it that? Not that. Not that. We got 38 seconds, 37. We have three very good candidates, yeah. apparently. So then Sport won, uh, uh. Holistic Air, two, and Palette Club. Oh. <laughs> oh, but maybe not. Look at that. <laughs> this is very exciting. What do we do if it's a tie? Uh oh, there's a tie. It's we need a tiebreaker. Tie All right, we've never had a tie. So that's interesting. All right. <laughs> we will figure it out and let you know. But that's Thank awesome. you, everyone. So, Holistic Air and Pallet Club, you're in. And then we'll decide what to do with uh, my buddy and Zen Sport. That's hilarious. All First four of them. Let's be inclusive. Yeah. <laughs>